we're live. To there Pints we go. with Aquinas. My name is Matt Fratt, and my guest is Jonathan Van Marin. Morin, Marin, Morin, Marin. Marin, yeah. <laughs> we're drinking coffee and Budweiser and cigars just to prove that we have testicles. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. Hey, before I begin, I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Covenant Eyes, which is the best accountability mm. and filtering software on the web. And if you struggle with porn in any way, you should get it. It doesn't just block the bad stuff. It gives your an account of, it gives your internet activity in a easy to understand report to a close friend. So I would highly recommend if you're a parent and you allow your children to use the internet that you do not let your children use the internet unless you have covenant eyes. Mm. Because imagine how your life, how my life, I don't know about you, but my mm. life as a teenager would have been very different mm. if I knew <laughs> that my dad was going to see what I was uh, what I was looking at. So CovenantEyes.com, click the link in the description below, and that's how you'll get a 30-day trial at the end of that 30 days. If you don't want it, you can cancel, but I don't think you will. I use it on all of my devices and recommend that everybody get it. CovenantEyes.com. The promo code is obviously... Pints. Is it really? I hope so. Ah! <laughs> we, I don't, okay. <laughs> Why so, do they pay us? Well, okay, so here's the thing. Pints though, or every, Mavrad? Just use one of those. The link will work, though, because Ryan said it. That's what I was going to say, yeah. They they tell us, every week we say we need to get the pi the promo code, but the only thing they've sent us is a link, as far as I can tell. It's the worst. <laughs> Jonathan, it is so nice to have you. Yeah, it's nice to see Dude, you again, finally. Uh, yes! When did we last hang out? I think it was at a big porn conference <laughs> somewhere. Anti-porn <laughs> conference. Anti-porn Specifically, conference. we hung with a whole bunch of Mormons in Houston or Austin. Yeah, there was, a, there was a yeah. feminist. There was a uh, yep. uh, Gail Dines, you remember? Yep. Yeah, vividly. Vividly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was there. Was... There was a whole bunch of former porn stars who were telling their story. That was wrong. Yes, one yeah. of them came up to me to thank me for my work, and I had to mm -hmm. pretend I didn't know who she was. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to, but I did. Because I was ashamed, as I should have been. Right, that's right. She would have been in the industry around that time. It was, yeah, hot. Yeah. yeah. So we used to do that a lot together. Uh, and you're from Canada. I was actually born in the states, but okay. I was raised in Canada, and that's where I live now. So How is the communist republic of Canada <laughs> going, I, or is that too hard? You no. Know, so when people used to say that, I'd be like, No, okay, just calm pull down. that out. Your mouth pull just up a to my mouth a little, little bit. bit more. There we yep. go. How's this? Yep, yep, yep. Yep. I used to say that's a little bit too harsh, yeah. uh, but especially with the assisted suicide regime that's been metastasizing and growing ever since it came in in 2016, um, Canada is, I, I think, objectively in very rough shape right now. Uh, some of your listeners will know, your viewers will know that in 2015, our Supreme Court mandated that they legalize assisted suicide. They started to steadily move away from calling it assisted suicide because suicide, of course, is a trigger word for many people, obviously. Yep. <laughs> so now they call it medical aid and dying or MAID, which makes it sound far more compassionate, right? Like your loved one will get put to death like a household pet. And uh, now they've actually just, they legalized it for those with mental illness. And, and then this month they delayed it for a year to get it right because all the horror stories have been trickling in about people um, opting for assisted suicide because they're poor, uh, because they're disabled, because they can't afford the care that they need. And so basically Canada's turned into an international cautionary tale in about 24 months. And I don't think anybody is fully cognizant of how bad it's going to look just under a year from now if if they do start permitting assisted suicide for for those with mental illness because at that point uh the only thing you'll need to be eligible for assisted suicide is feeling suicidal so the government will be endorsing your cognitive distortions and will actually be facilitating and funding uh, your own death mm. so and canada's not doing great is that the primary reason what about covid lockdowns and things what was that like people come up to me on the street and yeah. they say like things about Australia. I'm like, dude, I haven't been there. I don't know. Like I, I hear it was rough in Australia, but what was it like in Canada? What is it still like? So in Canada, it varied. So it's, it's, it's over in Canada now, unless you talk to the prime minister who every once in a while genuflects in that direction, just to assure everybody that he wasn't making things up prior before. <laughs> but like each province was kind of different at, at the height of one of the waves. I forget. It was very wavy for a while. Um, there was like pretty much everybody, I think, had some sort of stay-at-home order or lockdown. I think the the big news out of Canada, of course, was that they the Freedom Convoy descended on Ottawa with hundreds of truckers and thousands of people and Were kind of there? locked the capital down. I, I went there to cover it like right before the crackdown, right before they sent in all the cops. Um, 
And the scandal that doesn't get talked about nearly enough in Canada with relation to COVID is that based on the dates we have now from the Pfizer data and from what Justin Trudeau was saying, he ran a whole election on this idea that you didn't have to sit next to the unclean on a plane or a train. And there was mandates for like interprovincial travel. Like you couldn't fly from Ontario to BC mm. to visit a dying relative if you were not fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, and we now know that Pfizer already knew before this mandate went in that it didn't stop transmission, which was the fundamental basis mm -hmm. for the mandate to begin with and yeah no, nobody seems to be really picking up on that in the mainstream media as much as i'd like because it's an obvious political scandal he actually made the vaccine more political than it already was by running a whole election on it so yeah mm. that wasn't great either so what kind of pushback is the uh, euthanasia position getting in canada is there yeah, here's the most like depressing thing about about euthanasia and assisted suicide in Canada is that when when euthanasia was legalized by the Supreme Court in 2015, it was about 80 20. 80 percent of Canadians supported assisted suicide, 20 percent opposed. Now, with the expansion uh, of of medical aid and dying to those who suffer from from mental illness or mm. or it'll be disability, it'll be basically anything. The the, it, the law is worded so vaguely that anybody who isn't receiving care that they think adequately treats their condition can can apply for this and be eligible. It just basically means everybody. And like for the first time, we're seeing the polls shift. The majority of Canadians actually oppose this. And what's what's so almost confusing about the way this government and the justice minister, David Lametti, um, is that not only are the majority of Canadians opposed to this, because everybody knows somebody who struggles with mental illness or has struggled with mental illness. Pretty much all of us know somebody who has struggled with suicidal ideation or, mm -hmm. or has attempted suicide at some point. And the parliamentary committees have been hearing testimony from disability rights groups, from the Canadian Association for Suicide Prevention, from mental health advocates. And it's been almost a complete and unanimous no to this this policy expansion. And they're not backing down. And in fact, you had uh, uh, a very prominent doctor from Quebec who runs one of the gyne gynecological societies um, and pediatric societies come out and say, we should actually consider legalizing assisted suicide for infants under the age of one Dear Lord. with like severe disability, et cetera. And as you know, you can't assist somebody in suicide below the age of one. And so basically he just openly advocated for euthanizing babies. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the headlines that was really on point, but kind of jarring to read in a national newspaper was Canada cannot become a country that kills its babies. Now, of course, we already do up until nine months through abortion. Um, but like that was as a headline in a national newspaper, right? Not on some pro-life site or socially conservative oriented media outlet. No, this was just, this was straight up in a national newspaper. Um, I think that even with that, the thing that ter genuinely terrifies me the most as somebody who has mental illness running on both sides of his family and one of my kids could easily have it just based on their genetics is uh, that they're also advocating for assisted suicide for what they call mature minors which basically means somebody who's not old enough to drink, vote, or drive, but somebody who is apparently mature enough to make the decision to opt for assisted suicide. And in the parliamentary documents, it actually says that although we understand parents would be very opposed to this, um, we have to recognize that the right of that child to suicide would override their parents' right. desire oh to goodness. keep them around, which means that a euthanasia provider in. Yeah. could go into the family home, could euthanize the child in the family home, with oh. the force of the state preventing the parents from intervening. And this is not some wild theory. You can read this in the doc. Once you, once you read what the documents actually say, this is what they're advocating for. And so this genuinely terrifies me in a way that nothing's terrified me before. Like, as you know, I work for a pro-life organization. Um, I've been working on issues like abortion for years. But this is an issue where I don't think those who support it fully realize what the implications are. And I don't think people who are ignoring this as another culture war issue at the top recognize that this will have a very real impact on their family at some point, especially because we have absolutely piss poor care for for those who suffer from mental illness mm -hmm. and of course coming out of uh, coming out of covid we have a, a mental health pandemic when i lived in australia and australia is similar to canada i think in mm -hmm. that our news outlets are run by the lefties and yeah. there isn't a sort of serious contender yeah to push back against them even though in america you'd want to correct Fox News and Daily Wire. You know, we all yep. have different opinions. But it feels like there is a significant contingent within the United There's States a that's, that's able yeah. to push back. Whereas, yeah. at least from when I lived in Australia, I didn't feel like that. 
it doesn't seem like you have that in Canada either, unless I'm mistaken. No, so so the National Post is slightly more right leading, but I would call them libertarian, which mm-hmm. meant that they were sort of um, a lot of their speakers were very much at odds, or their writers were very much at odds on assisted suicide. Although to give credit where credit is due, a ordinarily liberal writer named Andrew Coyne was magnificent all the way through the legalization process, Bless and him. and the way he did it was by posing really difficult to answer questions, such as, um, do you need to sterilize the needle before you give somebody a lethal injection during assisted suicide? Suicide. Does it matter? <laughs> yeah. Exactly, right? Yeah. So he would actually, like, he wrote wow. columns asking questions like that. So the National Post would be would be slightly libertarian. There, There is no successful TV network that competes. So do you find that a lot of conservative Canadians are listening to the Daily Wire? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's it very, <laughs> this is a, a totally uh, separate rabbit hole that we don't need to go down. But what's interesting about Canadian conservative politics now is that a lot of Canadian conservative voters are very frustrated because they spend all their time following American politics. Yeah. And they're like, why can't we have a Ron DeSantis? Or why right. can't we have it's somebody? It's like America is accused of thinking it's the yeah. center of the universe, Whereas, but we have good reason because every other country yeah. is looking at us. Yeah, so, but yeah, Canada is a, you know, a post-Christian country, has been for a long time, has no unified national identity. No. And so what's possible? possible in America simply isn't possible mm-hmm. in our country. And I, f- I do feel sorry for the the handful of very good members of parliament who constantly speak to these issues, who are stuck being asked why they can't pull off the impossible. Obviously, America is uh, declining or has hit almost hit the bottom. So I'm not pretending America is in much better shape than Canada. But when you look at our governmental structure mm-hmm. with our checks and balances, coming from the place that you are in Canada, do you see the value in that? Do you feel like America will be able to hold out longer because of how governmentally it's set up? So not only governmentally, but I think the the fund, there's a couple of fundamental differences that mean America has survival chances that are better than most of the post-Christian West. One is that although America is becoming rapidly post-Christian, there still are over like over 30 million people who identify as evangelical. They're all armed to the teeth. They're all uh, like viewing their own media. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are building their subcultures. Uh, in Canada, just to give you an idea of, of what the decline looks like, and this would be largely true for most European countries as well 11 percent of canadians attend any form of worship regularly that's it so that's not just churches that includes mosques synagogues goudoirs temples wow so 89 percent of canadians attend no form of of worship regularly and regularly just means monthly um <laughs> and so and then now take the percentage of that that would be say like practicing conservative protestant or practicing catholic and you're talking about an absolutely minuscule number of people and so we're definitively post-christian in that it wasn't our parents who abandoned christianity in many cases not even the grandparents we're talking about the great grandparents i first realized this like doing pro-life activism we're out in the street all the time and you talk to people and growing up in a religious community you kind of assume people rejected your values at one point mm-hmm. and then talking to people I'm like they have no idea what i'm talking about like a quarter of millennials in the UK don't know who the baby in the manger is in nativity scenes. Mm-hmm. So we've completely lost a way of speaking, a way of understanding. The Christian social imaginary that once dominated all of Western civilization is gone. In the, Uni- in the United States, that's not true. And that's what makes it very interesting. Like I always say that in, in Canada, somebody who wants to be prime minister who's pro-life has to pretend he isn't. And somebody mm. who wants to be the Republican president in the U.S., if he isn't pro-life, has to pretend he is. Mm-hmm. And that means that there's a lot of political reasons for them to at least uh, pretend Great that they, they, hold, they hold these values. And so mm. America still has a lot more going for it than anywhere else. In America, we've seen this big exodus from blue states yeah. like California and New York. Are you seeing an exodus from Canada to to America, right? So it started. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, most people that I know, and I think it was during COVID, not even, regardless of your views on COVID restrictions and things like that, it was, I think, when they realized that a government that was profoundly hostile to Christian values could actually claim enormous amounts of power for itself, basically on a whim, and there was no recourse and the courts would back them. I know a lot of people who moved to the U.S. I know a lot more mm-hmm. people who would if they could, and I know plenty of people who have been discussing it ever since then, for sure. I think I misunderstood you earlier. You were talking about this medical assisted what? They call it a medical aid in dying. Medical aid yeah. and dying. In dying. In dying. Okay. Yeah. Um, how important, obviously the answer is very, mm-hmm. but explain to us why, is the word game where you where you phrase the mm. debate in order to change minds. Because now you have to ask people, are you against medical mm-hmm. aid in dying? And they'll just say made. 
It's really interesting that you point that out. A couple of years ago, I wrote a very small book with my colleague, Blaze Elaine, called How to Discuss Assisted Suicide. And one of the things we found was this is and this is particularly interesting because you're a media guy. You'll be interested in this is that when the debate started in 2015, people were still talking about assisted suicide or euthanasia. Mm -hmm. Now, just to parse the terms for a minute, euthanasia is when somebody else kills you even if it's at your request. Assisted suicide is actually when you do it yourself. So in Oregon, if you want to kill yourself, you've got to order the pills, you've got to take the pills yourself. If you can't physically give yourself the pills, somebody else can't give them to you. So in Canada, what we actually have is euthanasia because it's the doctor doing it. So they're already lying by calling it assisted suicide. They've already clouded the terminology. But I remember the month it happened. I wish I could, uh, I wish I could tell you, uh, cause I remember which year it happened where we were talking about assisted suicide, assisted suicide, assisted suicide. And a lot of pro-life ethicists were saying, no, this is euthanasia. This is not assisted suicide. And then suddenly overnight, every newspaper, like the Toronto star, the Globe and Mail, the Winnipeg free press, everybody started calling it medical aid and dying. Hmm. And my theory is that they basically got the new talking points from, from dying with dignity which is basically like the the suicide version of the human rights campaign down here. Mm. Um, and that, okay, it's time to, to change all the terms, right? Just like the trans terms have changed so many times in yeah. order to sort of herd people towards the right thinking. And so then they went from medical aid and dying to maid instead of assisted suicide. And the reason for that I wrote at the time with my colleague is that, again, nobody can ever – you can't sell suicide – because for the vast majority of people, suicide will never be something they see as positive. Because the vast majority of people know somebody who has been suicidal, that they love very dearly, who they desperately attempted to help, desperately didn't want to commit suicide, because they knew that if that person died, some part of them would die with them. They knew this. Mm -hmm. And so they, they moved away from the word suicide because they couldn't sell it properly. And I was speaking in the Netherlands last summer on this issue. And I saw an article from an American uh, columnist saying, in order to get assisted suicide here in the United States, we need to move away from this, uh, the word suicide because it has too many negative connotations. So in the States, I think there's, there was half a dozen at my last count who are pushing for similar policies. Like, watch the words. The word mm -hmm. suicide is going to disappear at some point, and they're going to replace it with terms that make it sound like end-of-life care, which you know didn't used to mean a lethal injection. It used to mean palliative care. Um, and, and then you're going to, you're going to see this very, very distinct shift. Mm. So you're bang on. And it's like that with all things that ought to be, um, uh, we should think about these things with great disgust. Sodomy is one of those mm -hmm. things. So in order to sell sodomy, you have to call it gay and you have to use a rainbow flag. Yeah. And even then you really need to be reluctant in allowing your two male leads to kiss in a movie because mm -hmm. people really don't want to see that. And we're now inserting that, but even, I don't know how people are that interested in seeing that. It's pretty disgusting, and it should be disgusting. So it mm -hmm. it it, mm -hmm. it it feels like you have you have to do that. You have to lie. Have you, have you ever read After the Ball? No, by Kirk and Madsen. So After the Ball, um, how America will overcome its fear of of homosexuality in the nineties. I think mm. I'm getting the subtitle yes, I've right. Yes, I heard of it. Yeah. Yep. He, they make the case you just made, which is that in order to get America on board with like same-sex marriage with homosexuality, what we need to do is de-emphasize the specifics that people automatically think about when this comes up and just start emphasizing things that they actually yeah. can understand properly. So yeah, terminology is everything. Oh, so it's go. like boring to bring up Orwell now, but anybody who hasn't read yeah, um, has the, the Ministry of Truth in 1984, like you do have to read it because the reason it's boring to bring him up is because he was so bang on that everybody notices. Yeah, yeah. Yes, golly. That's why I appreciate Matt Walsh and others referring to mm. this quote unquote transitioning surgery as child mutilation. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, how important is it then that we not only use the right terms, but reclaim older terms and start inserting that into modern parlance? So uh, Anthony Eslin actually makes that piece of advice and in, in, I think uh, Out of the Ashes, yeah, I read his last a, four and it, it, it's book. sort of like it all like his last four books are sort of stream of consciousness of all the things that he thinks. He has like, a, <laughs> so when I go off about this stuff, mm -hmm. I kind of stutter and I pause and I rant. Mm -hmm. His book Out of the Ashes is a very cohesive, coherent rant. Well, he rants, but he inserts he like with Milton and Dante yes, and exactly. all the way through. But one of his points is clear the can't. Like, we must speak clearly. Yeah. We must not permit them to take over the language. The I had a fight lie. with an editor, actually, at one of the magazines I wrote an article on Canada's killing regime for, over the term made. Because she said, this is the technical term, it's what everybody's using, and you do have a lot of conservative publications that are kind of like, well, we don't want to seem extreme. I'm like, well, too late. 
Um, if you don't think it's okay to give somebody a lethal injection and their life, you're extreme. So the very least we can do is use the word that proves they're extreme, which is suicide, not made. Which again sounds so anodyne, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It doesn't. It doesn't sound jarring or shocking. No, no. You might want your relative to have made. Yeah. Would you want your relative to kill themselves? Right. It's like maybe we could have the maid. Off of the lethal injection. One old lady came up to me and said, I think because women hate cleaning their house so much, they called it maid because people have a good, a good view of what that is. I'm like, I don't think that's what they were doing, but yeah. I appreciate the point. Yeah. So pushback in regards to this in Canada is just this one newspaper. So you're screwed. So Canada's uh, done. So what's like profoundly dispiriting right now about the assisted suicide question is that nobody's on the government side this time is we've seen a shift. It's not 80-20 in favor of assisted suicide anymore. Everybody's found their line, and the reason they found their line is because I think the government boiled the frog too fast, right? Usually it takes decades to slowly expand the regime. Well, that's what it's felt like here with the trans issue. 100%. Yeah. Very, very similar. But in Canada, the trans issue, like it came, it saw it conquered. Oh. And and almost immediately, they, they've changed everything in university. You declare your pronouns mm. and all the corporations, of course, wrap themselves in the rainbow flag for at least a month, if not more. But with the assisted suicide issue, um, we've seen pushback from pretty much all of the disability groups, all of the mental health groups. Um, and for some okay. reason, the, the reason I don't understand it is because Justin Trudeau's mother has written like a very well-known memoir talking about how she struggled with suicidal ideation and deep depression. And for me, like expanding assisted suicide to those suffering from mental illness is just like such a basic failure of humanity that even for him, I don't get why he's doing this. All right, here are three big questions. What is the West? Why is it dead? And why does that matter? So it's, that's very interesting. Because so I would say the West was Christendom, and what is that? So Christendom would all would, would be collectively understood. It would be the all the nations that were formed by Christianity. So whether you've got the American Republic, whether you've got the the British constitutional monarchy, whether you've got the ruling princes of Liechtenstein or the monarch in Belgium, all of them are shaped by the Christian tradition. And even when they disagreed about whether or not that tradition was Protestant or Catholic, they all agreed that it was in fact Christian. And that's what they were arguing about, mm. was which form of Christianity it would be, not that it wasn't to be Christianity. And the reason I think that, that the West is dead and in many ways irrecoverable in the form that we used to recognize it is because Christianity itself, the West is definitively post-Christian with the sole exception of some places in America, um, in the United, or sorry, in, in, in Europe. If you look at the latest, uh, the latest polls for most Euro, uh, Western European countries, like I remember the, even the stats in Italy for, for regular church attendance shocked me. It was something like 17%. Um, I already told you the numbers for Canada, somewhere around 11%. And what's really interesting about the way that this has changed is that it's not just that the West is no longer Christian, is that it has no idea what Christianity actually taught. So the reason Christianity can be caricatured so effectively by progressives is because people are not aware of the, like, the basic stories mm -hmm. of Christianity. They're not aware of the Bible stories. Again, a quarter of UK millennials didn't even know who the baby in the manger was. Most of them have no idea what the Trinity means. Most of them don't even know what the, go the, like, the essence of the gospel story is. Even basic ascetical differences between Protestants and Catholics are misunderstood. Yeah. So if they need to demonize someone, they'll give him a collar. Yes, but he'll be Protestant, maybe. Or if they've got the angry old church lady who's very clearly a Protestant fundamentalist, she's mm -hmm. wearing a medal of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Yeah, it's just you're part of that group. Yeah. And you guys are all very bad. And so that's that's what, what, what I do find different about the United States is that you like Christianity is still part of the public discourse and you still have politicians that speak clearly into microphones on on CNN shows about their Christian beliefs, whereas you don't have that most other places. Mm. Um. But I think that once you're a couple of generations away from it, you start to realize the extent to which it was uh, the, the, the cohesion that mm -hmm. allowed our civilization to actually exist. And the best piece of evidence for this, interestingly, is I know you were, I was a huge Christopher Hitchens fan mm -hmm. uh, in, in university, not because I agreed with him on anything, but because <laughs> his responses were just phenomenal. Don't his were. debates were awesome to watch, <laughs> right? But I remember thinking in college that the big debates of the next decade were going to be on the historicity of the resurrection and, right. and debates on the specifics of Christian history. Like, you know, can we be more nuanced about the Crusades, perhaps? Or, you know, all, you, you, you heard all the arguments. The new atheists now have been replaced by atheists.
atheists that have this nostalgia for Christianity right. that they're almost embarrassed about. So Douglas Murray. Yes, uh, that's right? who I was just thinking of. Well, so I interviewed him and I actually asked him, do you think that the Christian conception of human rights, the idea of the sanctity of human life, will survive into the post-Christian era? And he says, I don't think so, and it terrifies me. Sir Roger Scruton never fully mm. managed to embrace Christianity, but it started going back to church. Mm. When they asked him why, he said, I'm hoping practice makes perfect. Mm. Um, Charles Bless Murray, him. who's one of the famous American philosophers who wrote The Bell Curve and a number of other books, uh, I interviewed him for the National Review, and he's an agnostic, but he told me that barring a religious revival, America will go the way of Europe and die. Mm -hmm. uh, Neil Ferguson, who's probably one of the most famous historians, he's married to um, Ian Hersey Ali. And he's written uh, The Looming Tower, uh, History of Money, all sorts of fascinating books. Um, he's recently stated as well that without Christianity as, the, as the, the glue that binds civilization together, he thinks it'll all be over. And he actually said to me, he's like, I think people should go back to church. Like, you know, you really need to go back to church because we're seeing what happens when nobody goes to church. And this is not something that we can sustain over the long haul. And then, of course, we got Richard Dawkins. Who it's kind of like watching the snake choke on its own tail, mm. right? You've got Richard Dawkins, who's now you know a culture warrior over transgender pronouns and things like that. Even J.K. Rowling, mm -hmm. right? Did you see the joke about Harry Potter? Like, what's no. the difference between right wing literature and left wing <laughs> literature? It's like two decades, right? Like everybody said, don't read Harry Potter, and now everybody's <laughs> like, and now she's a conservative. Yeah. So the, I think it, most interesting is all these really intelligent atheists who have spent a couple of decades trying to figure out where we're headed and looked up and been like, oh boy, yeah, like this is not going to be good. And it's because you can't undo the sexual revolution, and that's kind of shredded the moral fabric. What's sad about Murray is that he seems to realize that we need Christianity to survive, but that he can't find it within him to accept Christianity. And so it sounds like, unless I'm misunderstanding mm -hmm. him, that it would be good for society if we accept a fiction, but that we can't, that a lot of people just can't do that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so I'm going to do, I'll do a little bit of dangerous psychoanalysis because I've watched a lot of his interviews because I thought his books, uh, the, 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 the Strange, or the strange Death, of the, Death of the West, Madness of Crowds were mm. fascinating books. Um, but I don't think it's insignificant that Douglas Murray is, is gay and apparently has had a, a long-standing partner. Because, and he's defended very vociferously the idea that, that homosexual love is just as valid as heterosexual love and things like that. Like, I don't think it's insignificant that... He believes that firmly. It's shaped who he is. And, mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, Christianity, he, I, he's too clear minded to be a, an Episcopalian. Right. I, I, I think he's too intellectually honest to be like, I can buy into Christianity and get rid of all the bits I don't like. Mm -hmm. I think it's his, his intellectual honesty that keeps him away from Christianity to a degree because he knows it would ask more of him than he's perhaps willing to give. Um, and. That's true, I think, for quite a few people. One of the arguments he made on a, on a recent um, interview podcast where he was talking to Steve Meyer. Yeah, I saw that. Um, I found it interesting because he said what, what Christians aren't doing is they're not, they refuse to admit that we know different things now than we used to know. So whether that's Darwinian mm -hmm. evolution, et cetera. And so he said, we can't just unknow those things that's and now right. accept the historicity of the resurrection. And I did notice, though, that in that discussion, I don't know, if did you watch the same discussion? It was the one with four people. Yeah. I wish that Maya had have got more of a chance to speak. But did you notice that they, they didn't seem to be particularly interested in Maya saying, no, no, we do have an answer for that, right? right? He he would he would continually bring yeah. up these sort of scientific arguments for why Christianity can't be true. And Maya's like, no, no, like over here, yeah. I wrote a book. Yeah. And they would sort of move on. <laughs> yeah. And so I do sense the sort of closed off attitude towards exploring the idea that maybe all of the evidence hasn't been trending in one direction. Yeah. Which would be really yeah, interesting. Yeah, he kept saying things like, um, no one wants to admit that they yeah. don't know things. And it's like, no. well, uh, that's fair, Yeah, but it could be the case that you don't know about yeah. atheism being true or that agnosticism is uh, a viable position. And this is what the sexual revolution has done, right? Is that people have such a vested interest in the lifestyle that predominates in the West and Christianity is such an extreme religion when it comes to how you treat most of those behaviors. And one of the things that, that, that I'm more and more convinced of is when I realize how many generations it's been since we were a Christian culture that lived recognizably Christian lives where, you know, we had parents and then kids and then grandkids and mm -hmm. these big extended families and they all went to church and religion kind of shaped the way they lived and yeah. how they interacted with each other that were so far removed from that mm -hmm. that people can't actually... Um, 
they don't actually know what it would be like to live that way and they don't know how anymore um and you know there's a line from from tolkien right some things that should not have been forgotten were lost mm -hmm. sometimes when i when i see people ranting like you know how could you how could anybody have three four kids at first i'm like what are you talking about right like my dad came from a family of 11 my mom came from a family of nine i'm from five i've got like I think 110 first cousins, if you combine them, and then hundreds after that. Um, but I, I remember actually after a couple of years doing pro-life activism, like, okay, so maybe that's not just a, a screw off. Maybe like she's serious, mm. like that they really don't think this can be done. That the idea of marrying one person and having a bunch of kids is so far removed from their experience and from the experiences that have shaped their skills and their view of the world that they genuinely don't think it's possible. And I'm more and more convinced that that's the case, mm -hmm. that they just don't think that it's possible to live that way anymore. And this goes back to the question of, is the West dead? The, the next question I wanted to ask is, why is it important? And why is it even something of a relief to finally realize that as a Christian in mm. your efforts to evangelize? So I think the relief for me in realizing that the culture was fundamentally dead is because we could actually just leave the old culture wars behind. Mm. Um, and I, my view on this is probably slightly controversial in some circles because I don't necessarily think that we should stop, for example, uh, trying to take over school boards to pass legislation to keep, uh, you know, gender ideology trash away from kids. But I don't see that as retaking the institutions. I see that as harm reduction to those who are participating in them. I don't think that anybody looking at the numbers, anybody looking at the last 30 years, anybody looking at the influences of the educators and the history of the public system can actually claim that we can take back the public school uh, system. I do not think that it's reasonable to claim that we can take back the universities. I don't think it's even reasonable to claim that we can you know, retake the entertainment industry and build something that shapes a social imaginary different to the one that we, that we are currently mm. enduring. And so all of those things are dead, which means we don't have to fight for them anymore. Um, and as such, we need to start building robust subcultures that have a strong defense and a robust offense. And so a defense is, this is why politics is important, because we want the government to stay out of our communities. We want to pass our values on to our children. We want to teach them uh, the, uh, the things of the scripture. We want to teach them what healthy sexuality looks like. We want to teach them that the culture is garbage. We want to teach them that many of these governments are enemies to a healthy, fulfilled, happy way of life. And the offense is simply loving your neighbor. I think that any subculture that does not participate in the pro-life movement is abandoning God's call to care for the least of these and is abandoning children to a, a horrifying physical destruction. I, I think that these subcultures must become places where the refugees of the sexual revolution are able to flee, f to flee because the wave we're going to see in the next 10 years, I think, uh, the victims of these ideologies that conquered so quickly – it are, it's going to be astronomical. Um, I was chatting with Jason Everett the other day mm -hmm. who said that there's a subreddit group of detransitioners, yeah. over 40,000 people within that group. Over 50,000 now, I think. Okay. Have you heard the, did you see Chloe Cole tell her story? Not yet. Um, oh, she did it on Jordan Peterson anyway. She got a double mastectomy. Oh, I did see yeah, it. Yeah. So she had a double mastectomy oh, when she was 15. Bless her. That broke my heart. And so I did an interview with her for first things, I don't know, oh, a couple good. of months ago. And like, the things she was describing to me, it was such a weird moment because she's describing how like she had a double mastectomy. So they've severed those ducts and her chest leaks all the time. Oh. And she's trying to describe the things that are happening to her. And I'm like, Bless I'm a 34 year old guy talking to a kid. And the things she's describing to me are in relation to parts that like I shouldn't be hearing about. Mm. At the same time, it's because somebody took a knife to these parts and gave her drugs that, that resulted in permanent deformation. Rumble.com. Go over to rumble.com and we subscribe would. to Pints with Aquinas. Also, mattfrad.locals.com because I am kicking this hornet's <laughs> nest. Mm. Well, Pints is with Jason and now you. So please, please go subscribe. Mattfrad.locals.com, rumble.com. If you can make those the top two links. Yeah. Can we just quickly we'd really apologize appreciate for not being live on Rumble oh, and yeah. tell people why? Did I blast right. across the, the line? No, I want you to out? keep blasting. Okay. <laughs> this is what I was chatting with Jason with the other day. If we choose to remain silent on these issues, for I mean, there's a, there's an element in which prudence needs to dictate what mm -hmm. you say. There's no point kicking a hornet's nest unnecessarily, getting banned, and then no longer being able to speak in this public Agreed. square, which is YouTube. And yet, if we choose to remain silent on these issues, all we're showing is that we love the platform more than our viewers. And mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. So I want to keep doing this. I just, I find it hard to believe that we'll be here for long. So 
Uh, the reason we're not streaming on Rumble, we, we want to stream, whenever we stream, we want to stream on Rumble and YouTube. It's just we had some complications today, uh, but this will be up. This whole episode will be up on Rumble after this. So, yeah, please do it. Where are we? Chloe? Didn't mean to cut you off. No, but yeah. Yes, Chloe, but, Chloe, but you Chloe talked Cole. about they, they've, they've taken a knife yeah. to this girl. Yeah, and so I do think that these subcultures will have to be ready to receive all of these refugees because so many of these people are going to find out that they've been sold out by the entire affirmation industry. And it's affirmed them in so many different ways, mm -hmm. right? It's told them that, you know, if they want to be special and mm -hmm. they want to be unique, <clears throat> that they can do all of these all of these different things. They can have all of these different surgeries. And where are these people supposed to go when the healthcare industry is no longer interested? in helping them. Chloe Cole talks about how hard it is to get help. Yeah. Steubenville would, be, would definitely be an option. But so many of these people just don't know where to go after this. And I don't think... Um, I don't think people are fully prepared for the level of anger and betrayal these young people are going to have when you consider that the, 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 the second detransitioner to sue her doctor um, was transitioned at age 13. And... These are people, many of whom, many of these people, according to the TikToks they're posting, I just saw a Twitter stream this weekend, again, from another one who's just realized that I'll probably never be able to have kids, a decision that was made basically when I was nine or 10, whenever they put me on puberty blockers, and I'll probably never be able to experience um, sexual pleasure because uh, all of the equipment for that has been ruined uh, by the drugs they put me on. Uh, Imagine making these, those two decisions bless these before beautiful you're souls. old enough to drink, vote, or drive, right? It's just staggering. Uh, when I spoke with Michael Knowles on my show, he said something that I think will forever live in my mind, and that's the idea that we have to give people an off-ramp. Yeah. If we're going to, as fun as it might feel, to curb stomp ideologies, we can't forget that these ideologies are destroying real people's lives, and we don't want to make the mistake of, you know, curb stomping people's emotions and, and their, their beautiful hearts made in the image and likeness of God. And so, uh, how do we, golly... I don't know what the question is because I don't want to talk about what we've already talked about a thousand times before, but we've got to give these people an off-ramp. And I, my fear is that if these people feel deeply let down by medical professionals, by Joe Biden, who says a child should be able to get a sex change, quote-unquote, or be sexually, rather, gen genitally mutilated, I don't want them to see us as their enemies either. Like, mm. I want them to know that we love them. That's actually, you, you mentioned the language earlier. That's a, um, a, an interesting point because you said, quote unquote, sex change surgeries. I remember there was a, there was a couple of months there <laughs> where all of the major American newspapers, it was first like sex change surgeries, right? And then it was gender confirmation surgeries and it was gender affirmation surgeries. Like there's been a, a, a distinct shift mm -hmm. in all of the words they're using because what does gender affirmation mean, right? We're just making sure the body aligns with the mind, right? It's, so yeah, the language, uh, the language is, uh, is shifting there too. I, why is it that you think that Peterson wasn't dinged for that, for having a detransition to share his story. It feels like these guys are the greatest threat against this insane ideology. You mean Peterson? Not Peterson, but the person he interviewed, Chloe. Chloe Cole. I don't know, actually. I asked myself the same question because there's like an, so the whole interview is, is like really emotionally mauling because she's so young. And you realize what was done to her like long before she had any opportunity to understand what was happening. Um, and there's a, like this eight minute clip where all like Peterson can do is just sort of gawk and like mutter God's name a couple of times in a way that doesn't sound like blasphemy to me. It <laughs> sounds like kind of like a prayer under his breath. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe, I don't know, you would know more about this. Is, is there some people that are too big to cancel on YouTube? I don't think so. It depends if the incentive is there, I suppose. I know that I think Joe Rogan's perhaps too big for Spotify to cancel when they all came after him several yeah, yeah. months ago for his alleged racism and other things that he right. said. I think the only reason he wasn't canceled is because he's bringing in more money than they would bring in if they were to virtual signal right. by canceling him. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Mm. This is very good. I'm certainly not too big to be canceled in case that's what you're asking. <laughs> I'll no, be careful. Yeah, no, 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 I'm not concerned. I'm, I'm really not concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Thursday wishes I was, but I, oh, sorry, no, that's not what I'm. And I don't, at. I don't mean it in a cavalier way either. Right. I, I, I am honoured for this platform, mm -hmm. and it's. I'm so grateful that people watch it, and mm -hmm. I get to chat with wonderful folks mm -hmm. like you. I love it. But if I got cancelled tomorrow, I, I'd, I'd sleep really fine. Yeah, hmm. I'd have to figure out what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing about living in a Rust Belt town is things aren't terribly expensive. You know, like yeah. <laughs> you can buy a house for the price of a. Top, top of the line VCR. But uh, 
No, I really like that. The idea of mm. understanding that our culture is yeah. dead is a relief because we're not going to be able to resurrect it through a, through a president or something like no. that. No, and I do think that has to be somewhat better understood because you do have a lot of people who are trying to salvage something from a culture that's so obviously wicked and opposed to everything we believe in. So you, you'll you get these long think pieces about absolute trash TV shows or films where it's like, well, if you squint right, you can really see a redemptive message there. Yes. And I'm like, I'm okay. so well, tired of hearing Well, it's this. like, well, like there's only like a handful of archetypal stories that show up everywhere. So not hard to do. But in addition to that, there's a ton of blasphemy. There's a ton of pornography. And so I'm sorry, you can't justify looking at it by claiming that it's got some redemptive element to it. Because yes. you got to wade through a lot of garbage to get there. What standard do you think Christians should use when watching film? Or listening to music. So I I have to admit that with a lot of it now, like I don't listen to pretty much any secular music at all anymore. Not because I think it's all wrong, but just because it, at a certain point, like the industry is 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 pushing things that are so uh, evil that I I just don't want them in my life at all. Like it's kind of like Disney used to make, you know, like Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and Cinderella. And now they shoehorn some LGBT character into every single thing. You cannot actually have a Disney Circle subscription without your money being used to fund content that's explicitly designed to poison your kids. Yeah, explain what Circle is for those who don't know. That's a Disney filter, correct? No, uh, sorry, Disney Circle. Sorry, I mixed it up because we're, we're, ah. we're talking about porn earlier. No, yeah. uh, Disney Plus, Plus is it called? Yeah. Sorry, the streaming service. But I'm yeah. sure the same is true with the Disney Circle, which is quite ironic. You're yeah, they, funding a company that's trying to poison your children yeah. by buying a product that's meant to prevent your children from being poisoned. And, and I know everybody has to make different decisions, right? Maybe the shirt I was wearing was made in, in China or something like that. So the, the response argument to me will be, okay, but you know what? Everything we buy probably mm -hmm. originates in something that's not completely ethical. And that's and that's a decent argument. I would argue, however, that, that things like... So entertainment, which C.S. Lewis called the devil's substitute for joy, I think is far more powerful and far more insidious. And I do not think that the sexual revolution would have gotten as far as they have without it because what we've seen on on a whole bunch of key issues is that stories and storytellers have reshaped the way a whole culture thinks about it so i'll give you a couple of examples if you look at the way our culture views assisted suicide now um assisted suicide as a noble option those who perform it being noble people basically it's sort of the pinnacle of autonomy right our culture worships autonomy and this is sort of the final defiant mm -hmm. act uh where you you claim your autonomy for yourself mm. forever i'm thinking of the first um, song, let it go like that. But the films that have been paving the way for this have, have been have been at work for decades. So you had Million Dollar Baby, where the struggling Catholic coach eventually finds it within himself to euthanize his uh, his his struggling fighter who's been you know disabled because apparently she's better dead than disabled. The medical show House mainstreamed euthanasia throughout the entire thing. He was always performing different forms of euthanasia. There's one episode where he gives you can see it on YouTube a whole speech. Basically saying everybody does it, which is the same argument the abortion activists used to say, right? Like, we're not making sure it happens more. We're just going to put guardrails up and ensure it happens safely. Same arguments being made by TV shows like that. Law and Order did the same thing. You may have heard of that really grotesque show, Me Before You. I've heard of it. Never watched it. Right? So there's this young woman who... I watched it on the plane when it first came out for an article I had to write. And there's this young woman who gets hired to care for a, a, somebody who has quadriplegia. And then what, end up, what ends up happening is she falls in love with him. He comes out of the shell. He falls in love with her. And then he commits suicide because she better, she'd be better off with somebody who could walk. Right? Goes to Dignitas in Switzerland and dies by lethal injection. And this movie was considered to be one of the best hits of the year. And the book mm -hmm. sold a couple of million copies. And so are you familiar with the term social imaginary? No. So uh, Dr. Charles Taylor mm -hmm. wrote, wrote the yeah. book uh, Our Secular Age. Yep. Um, and one of the things that he talks about is is uh, the social imaginary, which is all the stories and the storytellers and the traditions that shape the way we think without us even being fully cognizant of that. Mm. And uh, Charles Truman, in his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, mm -hmm. discusses how the sexual revolution fundamentally changed our social imaginary in ways that we're not fully aware of. I, the, uh, something that's coming to mind is maybe... 50 years ago, the American dream was a white picket fence and a house and a dog and a couple of kids. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, it's been influenced largely by friends 
where you live in New York City and you just have a series of uh, fornicating relationships mm -hmm. and you have nothing to tie you down. Which was the explicit intention of the creators of Friends. Is that right? When they so they they were the, the second uh, they had they hosted the second same sex wedding on TV, and they actually said up front like we're going to get a ton of calls, um, and and we got to be prepared for this because we're breaking new ground here, right? It's like the, the the one with the lesbian wedding. Right. They got three calls, like three calls in response, wow. and that's when they realized they were pushing it an open door. Oh. Right? There's that famous quote from Lennon. Right. If you st if you stick your bayonet in, you feel steel, withdraw and push again. When you feel mush, keep pushing. <laughs> and so a lot of the storytellers of our culture have been testing the limits. How far can I go? And when they feel mush, they keep on pushing. Yeah. And so that was true for friends. It was true for pretty much every sitcom following that. And so our social imaginary has been reshaped by these stories and storytellers. It's mainstreamed the idea of assisted suicide. It's mainstreamed the idea of, you know, casual hookups because even porn was a punchline in friends 24 yeah. seven, right? It was like kind of yep. hilarious. Yeah. The only weird thing would they be if somebody was weird about it. They treated nicotine with absolute scorn mm -hmm. uh, and racism, which they ought to have treated with absolute scorn, which was good. But the casual hookups was celebrated, laughed about. Worse than that is they actually celebrated the kind of predatory hookups that came to define the hookup culture. That's right. Right? You like you Ross have Joey looking over at the bar and saying, she's needy, she's vulnerable, I'm thinking yeah, cha-ching. Or, or Ross Geller right? hooking up with a student. Yep. All of that kind of stuff. And now we have, like, the LGBT movement has completely taken over the entertainment industry. Um, we had... Um, What's that guy? He plays Sheldon Cooper in the Big Bang Theory. Uh, yeah. Whatever, something Parsons. Does okay. that make Jim sense? Jim Parsons. Yeah. Thanks. So anyways, he does. Uh, he has a whole show now on like two parents discovering they have a transgender child. Uh, there's a non-binary bison on a major kids show on Netflix. Blue's Clues featured a post-operation transgender beaver with chest scars in a parade to celebrate transgenderism. Mm -hmm. uh, Velma of Scooby-Doo came out as a lesbian. He, Peppa he, Pig has lesbian polar bears, right? Like... I keep getting back to this is why the West is dead mm -hmm. is good news because we don't have to get angry about this anymore. This is the new normal. Yes. And it's only getting worse and you should expect it to get worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to create subcultures that yep. have a strong defensive and offensive. Yes. I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. Yes. Where, where are you seeing that take place? What subcultures are you aware of and where are they and what are they doing right? Interesting because there's... Because where do you live? Ottawa? No, no, I live in Tilsonburg, which you've never heard of. Okay, is it in Ontario? Yeah, it's a okay. small town in southern Ontario. Um, it would be, it would, it would definitely qualify as, as a subculture for sure. It's so subcultures. There's a couple of key things. What's diff It's difficult to be a subculture when you have big tech and Disney pumping their poison into your homes, and we're not willing to cut it off. So, so we want to be well, but we're allowing ourselves to be poisoned. So this would be my first, my first point is that you cannot create a subculture until you cut off the sewage pipe. Right? You have to stop the mainstream culture from poisoning the groundwater in order to have a healthy community. And this is, there's a couple of points to that. We just talked about entertainment, right? If, if you basically allow your kids to have Netflix, to have Disney Plus, to have all of these streaming services, you are genuinely allowing the enemy to have time with your kids. You are allowing their storytellers to tell stories to your kids. Right? There was a joke, I forget which old comedian said it, this is like decades ago, where he said TV was an excuse to have people that you would never allow into your home speak to you in your home. That's basically what these streaming services do. And so we're still trying to kind of have it both ways, right? Yes. A lot of Christians defended Game of Thrones or mm -hmm. um, what's another obvious example? Um, Yellowstone is the new one that's really, really popular. And you have a lot of conservative hosts that push this trash as well. Now, my understanding, I never, I watched, I think, one episode of that. My understanding was they kind of get in the door and they show that you're going to be a rather wholesome sitcom that uh, both left and right can enjoy. I, they did this with uh, was it Ted Lasso? Okay, uh, which was the it was an American football coach who moved to England to coach a soccer team, mm. and he was this good old Southern boy, very optimistic, and then a ton of fornication and yeah. evil was pushed in like five episodes in or something. Yeah. Is Yellowstone like that, where it begins with some kind of promise that conservatives could appreciate it, and then what does it do? I suspect so. The, I actually only looked it up after a whole bunch of people at anti-porn presentations I was giving 
came up and was like, this is a very triggering show. There's a lot of really graphic sex scenes. Like really? I, last yeah. weekend I gave, I gave four talks on this and I, it came up at three of them. Really? That Yellowstone was full of these really graphic sex scenes. God have mercy. Um, and that sort of thing. Like, I think we have to, we have to cut that off in order. Y- your kids are never going to be interested in reading the great classics. They're never going to actually delve into what, what Anthony Eslin calls the unused artillery of the culture war, which is this cultural inheritance, which is still ours, but we don't bother to use anymore until we cut off all of the stuff that's being pumped in Mm -hmm. the TikTok, social media entertainment and pornography a decent chunk of which is persuasion technology that literally reshapes the way we think it makes our brain unsuited to reading it makes Mm -hmm. our brains like 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 physically unsuited to actually enjoy the things that western civilization did produce that we have now largely forgotten about and so the number one thing that I think Christians can do to build subcultures is to admit that the mainstream culture is dead, to stop trying to redeem things from it in, I think, really flimsy ways, and to cut it out entirely. Because who, which storytellers are you allowing to spend time with your kids? And you're not going to get a single wholesome kids show that isn't going to buckle eventually, mm. right? Mr. Radburn and Arthur got married to a dude. There was gay moms in Clifford. Peppa Pig had lesbian polar bears. Again, the reason I like list off a whole bunch of them is because I'm trying to systematically remove people's excuses for keeping these streaming services. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you're going to have narrower and narrower and narrower choices. <laughs> and eventually you're going to run out of them. But then you're going to be like, well, how do I distract my kids? It's like, yeah. well, find a storyteller who doesn't want to poison their minds. And who's one of those? Who's creating maybe good cartoon or so it's it's much more difficult good movies. I mean, I, I understand there that are some, your ideal would probably be read good literature to your kids, and fair enough. But I recognize that that's also a lot of people. Do you have have you read anything Mark Bauerline has written? No. The Dumbest Generation and the Dumbest Generation Revisited. No, he runs the podcast for I didn't first understand things. Understand it. <laughs> no, and, and I interviewed him and he said, I'm actually just begging kids to read anything. He's like, their brains are so unsuited to reading that it's very difficult for me to get them into like the kinds of books that you like, like Dostoevsky is just sort of legions away from where, where they're actually going to end up. So here's a, here's an interesting aspect of the discussion because, so I know this is what Daily Wire is attempting to do. Yeah. We'll see if they pull it off. Well, so I'm very unimpressed thus far for a couple of reasons. I don't have any opinion on their children's entertainment, but when they produced their 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 first film, mm-hmm. right? Uh, what was it? Run, hide, fight. Right. And they announced that they were coming out with this this movie and conservative entertainment. They were breaking into the industry. They were gonna they were gonna combat the streaming services. And I was pretty enthused because somebody needs to take up the space, and they're probably the only guys big enough to do it. Mm-hmm. And so I just went to either Common Sense Media or PluggedIn.ca to check to see what this film was all about. And basically, it's another revenge shoot em, uh, like shoot 'em up flick that emphasizes all of the same vices that the other revenge flicks Hollywood puts out does. It includes frontal nudity at one point that's listed. Or at least I think a woman was made to take her top off and yeah. her bra was exposed. Yeah, and I was like, well, okay, so basically this is the same trash that they're pumping out of L.A., but I'm just giving my money to somebody who's better. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... I'm not. I'm, I'm unimpressed by the take that a lot of the conservative commentators have to media, and it makes me wonder what kind of subculture they're going to create. Because Ben Shapiro, Lauren Chen, Andrew Clavin, David French, they were all posting nonstop, you know, spoilers for Game of Thrones and talking about what a great show it was, yes. and excusing this completely hedonistic show that try to plumb new depths of evil season by season. And we now know from the stars who have done interviews that they were like brutally exploited during all of this, that, you know, Amelia Clark and the enormous bearded fellow she was starring with were drinking vodka to get through the sex scenes because of how traumatizing it was for them because they were simulating rape, but it felt real. And so the God. very people who are, are spearheading this new cultural renaissance that they talk about, I'm still, I'm rooting for them. I'm very much rooting for them. But based on their level of discernment about other shows, I, I'm not particularly optimistic. Yeah, so it's like, where's that line where you want entertainment, maybe? And so you want to choose what's the least bad. Right. And <laughs> what's least bad today um, would have been considered perhaps horrific, you know, 50, 80 years ago. Yeah. Do we just, I mean, it's a difficult question to ask, like, where do you draw the line? Because some of it does have to do with one's kind of personal uh, predispositions. I personally cannot watch anything that contains sexual content within it, by which I mean pornographic content within Mm -hmm. it, because of my own past. 
uh, it's something that maybe my wife could go, oh, I'll just fast forward that. But mm-hmm. I, I can't even do that. So where do you think Christians should be drawing the line? Or is it is that too difficult a question to ask? I don't really think so. I, I think the answer is just simple, but most people hate it. All right, it's go said, on. Well, like, so this is the show Pints with Aquinas. It'd be interesting to find out what Aquinas would think the line would be. Um, uh, Augustine wrote a lot on on uh, um, on lust and things like that. I think we probably know where his line would be. I think mm-hmm. the scripture is pretty explicit. Mm-hmm. So I find that people shift to yeah. getting very philosophical yes. when we're talking about whether or not their favorite show with a sex scene in it is still watchable. Mm-hmm. And I just, I like, give me an argument that's backed by church fathers, it's backed by scripture for mm-hmm. why you were allowed to watch that. This would be a good parody video, you know. <laughs> in 50 years, you've got Christian commentators saying, well, yes, it was filled with rape, but it was heterosexual rape. Yeah. And so there was still that element yeah. of, yeah. you know, what God intends. It pissed all the right people off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, which yeah. is basically the new standard for what you're allowed to watch. Is like it makes the woke yes. people so angry, so everybody should get out there and watch it. I, I also find myself disappointed with conservatives uh, celebrating Chris Rock's latest stand-up comedy. He yes. said a few things that may piss off the left, therefore mm. he's our new cultural hero or something. So and so I made the mm. mistake of going, okay, well, I'll give it a, I'll give it a watch. Mm. You know, I'm sure you'll swear a bunch, it'll be fine. Yeah. Within five minutes, it was so disgusting that I thought, shame on me for even giving this a chance. It's very interesting you bring that up because there's a couple of very prominent conservative cultural commentators who are very intelligent, I like most of their commentary, who I think are getting it wrong on on what comedians are doing when they say bring up abortion, which is one of the key things Chris Rock brought up, right? He said he's he's, a, he's had so many abortions that he wants a death certificate for the baby and he's almost won himself a free smoothie. Right. We um, hear that go, look at him admitting yeah, yeah, that he, abortion. Yeah, that he's killing a baby. No, and Louis he's, C.K. He's celebrating. Louis C.K. did the same thing. So did, um, who's the, is he an Australian guy? I know the ginger. Uh, Bill Burr. Um, right. He did the same thing. And there was a fourth one. There was like four in a row. Uh, Dave Chappelle. So they all did a bit on abortion yeah. in the last like six or seven years. And they all kind of make the same case that abortion kills a baby. But who cares? And I'm like, like that's the punchline. Yeah, not so the ba- That's <laughs> what I mean. So, baby, so yeah. like conservatives are so starved for mainstream approval and so starved to say, hey, see, this person's one of us. And we're like, look, he admits abortion's killing a baby. And I'm like, I know. And then they say, but who cares? And everybody laughs. What I think they're doing actually is dulling moral sensibilities because the big mistake that a lot of Christians and conservatives made with comedy is they misunderstood the way it's used. And this is what Friends did, um, I think, best and kind of led the way for this is if you can make sin funny, it is automatically unserious. Sin cannot, uh, cannot be two things at the same time. Sin, uh, sin cannot simultaneously be a joke mm-hmm. and something so horrifying that's the right. son of God had to be nailed to a cross it's really to funny. free people from it. And so if it's consistently hilarious, right, when porn's the punchline, abortion's the punchline, hookups are the punchline, but they're simultaneously really amusing and hilarious, that doesn't work. And what these shows have done is we all sit down and we'll watch a sitcom on Saturday night and we'll laugh our faces off at one of the, the lovable playboys who's, you know, betting all of these, you know, injured, damaged women who didn't have dads. And then the next day we'll go to church. And try to put it on it, basically like adopt an entirely new moral framework the following morning. And what you end up having is this sort of schizophrenia where we justify things that I don't think previous generations of Christians would have struggled with. I think we're struggling with it because we want to hang on to it, mm. not because there's any good reason to keep watching yeah, so it. So quit struggling. Yeah. Let and go. start fighting. Let's Just go. Get rid of it. Yeah. It's funny that you bring that up because I'm not sure if you saw that clip that came out. Um, that Exodus series that Daily Wire is putting out. They just discussed yeah. last adultery uh, and, and that sort of stuff. Um, it was disappointing to see, to say the least, to see what Prager had uh-huh. to say, which was essentially that if a man uses pornography uh, to avoid adultery, eh, it's not that awful. <sighs> I, If Prager is open to discussing this topic, Mm -hmm. I'll have him on the show next month. If he's not interested, I I can't have him on the show next month. But there was a line in that clip that was disappointing where uh, Pajot was talking about sin. Mm -hmm. And Peterson looked at him and because Pajot says, I sin all the time. And Peterson said, that's why you're such a fun fun guy. And we all laughed. And I'm not trying to criticize uh, Peterson for that too much because I again I understand the joke and even Pajot laughs yeah but okay is it serious or isn't it serious yeah. I mean even sin is like we're saying you no know, sin's fun it's like no if you are someone deeply immersed in sin you're a boring 
uh, specimen yeah. of a human being. Like yeah. you're, uh, you're, you're, you're increasingly uninteresting. Sin yeah. dulls the personality, mm-hmm. doesn't lead it to flourish. And I, and I think that I've heard you say this in talks before. I think I heard you say it uh, at that conference we were at in Texas years ago, that you don't have a different brain to watch porn with. Yeah. Right, so you don't have a brain for one yeah. thing, and then a different brain for porn. Like it all bleeds. Yeah, the through. idea that I can watch porn and that somehow doesn't affect how I view women or yep. sex is just biologically untrue. And I think the same thing is true for entertainment. And I think that people are, are reacting to like the fundamentalists and, and the and the religious right and the moral majority because they think they were being too scrupulous about what was wrong. I actually think they got way more right than we do, um, like by far. Because if we're watching things that glorify sin, we don't realize what that does to our moral sensibility. So take all the heist movies, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Where like at the end of the day, who are you rooting for? You're rooting for the guys who were stealing, not for the guys who were being stolen from because like that guy's a bit of a prick. So therefore stealing is okay. And you spend an hour and a half really rooting for the people who are doing something that you would recognize to be objectively wrong. And because the story is so well made, the actors are so talented, the storytelling is so compelling, the visuals are so stunning you get sucked right into it and you don't even realize these like these these ways these, these things are kind of changing your moral sensibilities and changing the way you think and i think that we make moral compromises while we're watching these things throughout the show and that those moral compromises carry over into our life and suddenly we're struggling with oh, i know this show has some graphic sex scenes but you know i think i'm probably holy enough to watch graphic sex scenes now i can handle it which if you can find me where, like, if you can find me that definition of holiness somewhere in the last 2,000 years, I'm holy enough to watch pornographic scenes, then we'll have a secondary discussion. But I highly doubt you'll find it. Yeah. Yeah. So how then, this is good. This is good getting into this. Because I think um, as the left is pushing harder and harder, people are, the tent for what is a conservative <laughs> is growing wider and wider. Mm-hmm. So we're like, oh, yeah, Joe Rogan, he's a conservative. Mm-hmm. It's Okay, I'd like to understand what a conservative is. So mm-hmm. you tell me, what's, what is a conservative, or is that even what we should be doing? So the, the term has become kind of useless um, just because of precisely what you're saying now as the line is moving so far that people are accidentally finding themselves on our side, like Bill Maher, right, who made a documentary just mocking religion right. and, and, mo- and mocking God. And now everybody's like, look how conservative he is. Yeah. And this is part of, I think, the Stockholm syndrome that Western hmm. Christians have, too, is where they're so desperate for anybody to say something nice about what they believe that, like, Bill Maher can say this. They're like, see, he's on our side. I'm like, no, he's just driving the speed limit and the rest of them are boiling the frog too fast, right? So yes, it's true. Like when he went on Joe Rogan, for example, and said like, pornography is rapey, it's horrifying. I don't I don't get why people like this. People were like, see, even Bill Maher's admitting this. I'm like, no, it's gotten so bad that not even Bill Maher can ignore it anymore. Like this is not a sign that some people are waking up. This is a sign that things are so degraded and so awful that not even Bill Maher can ignore how bad it's gotten. <laughs> so I just think that mm. these people waking up and pointing out what's going on is not a sign that the left has gone so insane it's noticeable. It's a sign of how much territory the left has actually conquered that you've got Andrew Sullivan who claims to be a Catholic but is one of the primary gay rights activists probably probably the man most responsible for mainstreaming the idea that same-sex marriage could even be a concept he wrote his book virtually normal I think a couple of decades ago now more than that probably Um, and now he's considered a very conservative guy simply because he hit his line sooner than the people who were traveling down the same path with him did he's like no I'm gonna stop here they're like okay well we're gonna keep going Uh, And then a lot of us have moved towards where he did because we're giving up more territory too. And we're thinking this guy who claims to be married to a man and mainstreamed the destruction of the institution of marriage is now on our team. And Barry Weiss is the same thing, right? She left the New York Times. She's a lesbian who's married to a woman, married, and is currently attempting, I believe, to have children through some sort of horrific reproductive technology. Then you've got Douglas Murray. And I think the easy answer for why these people are now considered conservative is that these people are actually just comfortable with being dissident. Like, it would not have been easy to be an out gay person in the 80s. And I think the people who were willing to fight mainstream culture then and are also writers and creative minds are still comfortable fighting the culture now. Mm -hmm. And so they're still dissident and creative, tremendously talented, but they actually haven't changed Mm -hmm. at all. We've just moved closer towards them. So for me, a conservative first has to identify what he or she wants to conserve and then base his views on politics on that, 
which is why mm. I don't hold a lot of the same um, free market views that a lot of, of people who share my views would. I find the experiment going on in Hungary right now, the idea of a family-oriented economy, very, very um, interesting. I've kind of abandoned most of the specific ideological principles, and I orient my views, and I'm stumbling along and researching, right. and I don't know enough about a lot of this stuff, but it's start with what do you want to conserve. When there's nothing left to conserve... Then cut it off and let it wither and die. Because what's the point of, of of trying to redeem Netflix or redeem Disney Plus? What's the point of sending your kid off to be a missionary, you know, in the public school system, knowing they're probably going to get poisoned? So I think that you first need to know what you're going to conserve and then conserve that. Because I hold views that would not be considered conservative, but I think they're conservative because they're all oriented towards what I want to see conserved in society. Yeah, we'll get to that in a moment. But even our criticism light criticism of Daily Wire is going to met, be met with criticism in the YouTube comment section here. And I think part of it has to do with conservatives are so beaten down that we just, we do want to win. And we are getting well, wins I'm, I'm with Daily Wire. The, I'm rooting for the yeah, Daily Wire. Don't get me wrong. I, yeah. I am too. And I love a lot of the stuff that mm -hmm. they're doing. But even a mild critique of a movie that's going to be like a revenge porn kind of show, mm -hmm. you're going to have conservatives go, come on, just we need something. We, we Any criticism is going to be met with anger. Okay, let, me, let me ask you this question then, because then they put out their secondary film, right? Um, Terror on the Prairie, which was their first one with Gina Carano. That was an awful movie. And it had like, so I watched part of it because I was just interested to see what they were putting out. I'm like, just, okay, they bought Run, Hide, Fight. Yeah. This is something they made. Let's see what they've got. It. Why does every show now have to have some sort of explicit rape scene in it <clears> that, you know, kind of ends in a crescendo of gore? Like, just what is conservative about that? Mm. What is good or beautiful or true about it? I just, I don't see it. And it's, again, the whole story is motivated around revenge, which is not, as you might know, do you think a, a lot of concept. Do you think a lot of conservative political media is based around revenge? Well, like, we're just, is, we yeah. feel so beaten down. We just want to, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. curb stomp somebody. Well, um, <laughs> I couldn't put it better than Donald Trump, who said at his rally in Waco, Texas last week, I am your retribution. That's what he told the crowd. That was his biggest cheer line. So very much so. And partly justified. People have gotten so sort of ground down and mocked. And yeah. and and like their views despised. They've been told they're bigoted, transphobes. Yes. There's a new phobia we possess that I find out about almost every month now. Yes. Um, and so people, people are angry. And, yeah. and they're responding to all of this by saying like, smash it, burn it down. And... I don't think that Christians are allowed to take that attitude as much as I feel it daily and as mm. much as I understand it, I empathize with it, and we and really like to engage with. It might be that tension that's so exhausting. Yes, it is. It's yeah. the tension of, I do want to burn these people, these this this institution, not these people, these, this, you know, mm -hmm. I want to burn it all down. Um, so, like, let's do that. But if it's like, well, you want to, and yet what's the right answer? Ah. Yeah. It feels like a defeatist sort of yeah. response. But that's also because we've been shaped, the entertainment we've been shaped by, pretty much like every action movie the last 20 years has a good guy who gets pushed a bit too far, <laughs> gets a machine gun, and starts mowing everybody down, right? Like, work yeah. your way through the list. That is like the plot line Hollywood pumps out, is <laughs> right? Like, good guy who justifiably murders a whole bunch of people. Yes. And so, like, that, again, the social imaginary thing, we don't realize what sort of things that we're absorbing, but what stories are informing the way we respond to events. And if those stories are the stories the culture is creating, those stories largely focus on things like revenge. Mm -hmm. There's no redemption in those stories except for the fact that the good guy ends up being right, you know, with everything exploding behind him on a sea of corpses. Uh, uh, you know, I think the reason you're on this show is several months ago when I went to the Ukrainian border and started talking about that more and more, I got a lot of pushback from conservatives and will today because of this conversation we're about to have and bring it on. It's fine. Um, and so when you texted me an article you wrote, I'm like, oh gosh, here we go. Like there's another <laughs> conservative telling me Russia's right and I need to get with the program. Uh, and I was really pleased to see that that's what you, you weren't saying that. Mm -hmm. uh, break this open for us. Uh, it feels like because we have lefties wearing Ukrainian pins that Ukraine therefore must be the enemy now and we must be in some sense pro-Russia. Mm -hmm. Open this up. So there's a whole bunch of different things going on at the same time because I'm, I'm sympathetic to how a lot of uh, conservatives got there while rejecting their conclusions entirely. So I think the first thing we have to realize is that Putin has been the big bad wolf for years now. 
And so Putin is no longer a villain that anybody believes in, right? So you had the Russian collusion scandal with Trump that ended up being a nothing burger, but we heard about about mm -hmm. Russia being the bad guy and Putin being mm -hmm. the bad guy uh, for years and years. And then there was nothing. And then during COVID, anybody who was a dissenting voice was spreading Russian disinformation. Yeah. And so by the time Russia actually invaded somebody... <laughs> It was the boy who cried wolf syndrome, right? People are like, oh, Putin's the bad guy again. We've been hearing, we're hearing this for the 10,000th time in, in, in just a couple of years. Uh, so there's that. The second thing is one of the, the scarier aspects of, our, of our, uh, our, our institutions collapsing and being captured by the left is that they've rendered themselves unbelievable even when they're doing reporting that, that, that we should be looking at. And so when you have newspapers that are identifying, I just saw a BBC article this weekend, just the ugliest dude I've ever seen. You get three teeth, long hair, look mean. And it's like, you know, this is a woman who's being sent to a woman's prison because. Oh, for goodness sake. And like, there was another one. Like, this guy was honestly, like, he looked like he he woke up, you know, from sleeping under a bridge, murdered four people, got arrested, and then introduced himself as Janice. Right? It actually seems unreasonable to a lot of people to believe anything, anything that those newspapers have to say because BBC is obediently following the pronouns of some thug who raped a bunch of people or murdered a child. Those are all real examples. Um, they're all using phrases like gender affirmation surgery. We're also sort of in this moment, right, where Roe v. Wade was overturned on June 24 of last year, and the media is bending over backwards to not discuss the central character in the story, which is the preborn baby. And so when you know that the media is lying brazenly to you all the time, when the media is throwing up pictures of like brawny rapists, um, calling them by female pronouns and saying, who are you going to believe us or your lying eyes? They've set us up. Right. So now when they report, you know, Russia's invaded Ukraine, people are like, yeah, I bet. Right. Um, and so the like institutional trust in the media has collapsed precisely at the wrong moment for the poor Ukrainian Christians who are desperately trying to get their message out. And I, I, I know you've got some friends down there. So do I. A couple of them write for some of the same publications I do. And I was talking to one who's right around my age. And she said, like, the most horrifying, depressing and awful thing for me has to is to watch all these conservative commentators who I follow in Ukraine basically playing footsie with Putin saying he must not be all that bad because the New York times says he is bad. And like, these are the people that I follow. I share their values. Like I'm a Christian, I'm pro-life, I'm anti all this garbage. And yet here you are because the New York times is reporting on what's going on. You won't believe it. And that's like, there's a, like, you notice the, the view of the, the Ukrainians themselves almost never gets discussed. It's like, well, that's what the left says. And that's what like the neocons say. And this is what the right says. I'm like, why doesn't somebody ask the Ukrainians what they think, right? A largely conservative people who would not be on board with this agenda. Um, and, and, just, the, and just so people know, I'm going to Ukraine itself. We're going to Kiev and other places to visit some orphanages to offer some mm -hmm. help. Uh, we plan on re, uh, reinstalling windows that have been busted out in this one bishop's house. Um, and so I will get the story from them. I'll, I'll yeah. get to record them and hear what they have to say. That'll be phenomenal. That'll be phenomenal. Another one is a lot of really prominent journalists. One is Julia Iof. I probably just completely butchered her last name. But so I went I went to Russia in 2018 with a okay. with a Danish journalist and a film crew um, to actually report on the Christianization occurring in Russia. Basically, I was told that Russia is re-Christianizing. Yes. They're becoming Orthodox. And so it was a wild trip. We were there over <clears> the election. Like I was in Red Square for the rally they had to celebrate the annexation of Crimea five years earlier. Mm. And like Putin was like 200 feet away. Like it was a crazy experience. And so what I wanted to do was interview a whole bunch of people and find out like, what is this whole, you know, resurgence of orthodoxy thing? Yeah. And what's really interesting is so the, the number of Russians who actually attend church regularly is below 10% still. They have the highest abortion rate in the world still. And what we've ended up facing is, is a scenario in which Vladimir Putin, who, as everybody knows, was a KGB agent who went through this massive identity crisis after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which he'd committed his life to. There's a number of really good books about this. I think one of the best is probably uh, The New Czar by, by Steve Meyer. Um, and I'm actually ignoring a couple of other really good biographies because some of their views might be suspect to some people. So I'm recommending one that can be trusted. And basically, when he was looking for a thread of Russian identity that actually connected the modern post-Soviet Union Russia to the previous thousand years of Russian history, orthodoxy was what he came up with. Mm. And he's explicitly tied 
the communist regime to, uh, to orthodoxy in many ways. And in ways I would hope orthodox and Catholic people especially would be very uncomfortable with. So he actually compares sort of Lenin's body, which you can still see, right, in the mausoleum in, in, in Red Square. Very similar to the incorruptibles, although they spend millions of rubles trying to keep him minty fresh. Um, and and he tries to make all these connections and try to claim that actually this identity is there's a continuity from 988 with the introduction of orthodoxy all the way to his reign now in 2023. And interviewing people, I kept on asking, is Putin Christian? And pretty much all the nuns and priests were like, he's very smart, is all they would say. <laughs> um, and then I said, so why is he rebuilding so many monasteries? 23,000 monasteries he had rebuilt when I got there mm. was the number. And basically uh, what they said was, well, like he... It's not Christianity that, that Putin is embracing. It's Russianness, like mm. Russian orthodoxy. So who's in these twenty three thousand monasteries? They have they, so they are at the orthodoxy is experiencing a very specific and very nationalistic resurgence, mm -hmm. and it's very tied to the Russian state in a way that I I think is hard for a lot of Westerners to understand. So me and, and my friend who went were like the second journalists besides Rolling Stone to get into the compound of the Night Wolves in Moscow, and the Night Wolves is a motorcycle <clears> gang run by a guy nicknamed the Surgeon. Um, and they actually helped to liberate the Donbass with their machine guns back in, in, in 2014. They're banned from most Western countries now. But the Danish uh, journalists we were with got us in. And, and it's wild because they were kind of explaining how to be Christian is to be Russian. To be Orthodox is to be Russian. And these things, the Russian state is fused with the Orthodox Church. Very similarly to how it was during the Soviet Union when, you know, the yeah. communist government was selecting most of the clergy and it was thoroughly infiltrated by the KGB. But the reason so much of what they're saying sounds sane, and this goes back to what we said before about the left has retaken so much territory that we're actually responding to their victory rather than actually speaking from, from a perspective of our own beliefs, is you've got the patriarch Kirilli, right, say things mm -hmm. like, yeah. you know, it's insane. Uh, you know, that they say, you know, men are women and women are men. And we're like, absolutely. I'm like, thank you. That would be normal 20 years ago, right? This doesn't mean that he's good because when somebody says something obvious and true, it matters who is saying it and it matters why they're saying it. Like Xi Jinping has also banned LGBT propaganda aimed at Chinese youth because he doesn't want to corrupt them, right? Benoche, the, the, the dictator in Chile, um, actually implemented a lot of like moral decency laws in defense of Catholic values while perpetrating horrifying things on, on female dissidents specifically, things better left unmentioned even on a podcast where you discuss pornography. And when you go through these dictators, like Gaddafi ran rape rooms in the basement of his palace while inveighing against homosexuality at the African Union. So did Robert Mugabe, who murdered I don't know how many people, but at the UN condemned the Western export of LGBT values. So like even 20 years ago, we recognized that when somebody says something obviously true, it matters who is saying it, and it matters why they are saying it. And so what we've come into is this period now where because the West is so insane and Putin seems saner on the gender issue than Joe Biden and objectively is, that we suddenly shift our loyalties to mm. somebody who is also obviously a murderer. You know, his his uh, political opponents have a bad habit of falling off balconies and ingesting rare poisons, and he locks up uh, journalists all the time. And even if you don't like the journalist he's locking up, as somebody who spends a significant amount of his time criticizing his own government, I do appreciate that I get to do that, you know, without ending up in jail still. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, 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 the Russian conundrum thing, I think that, they, that progressives created the conditions for Russian disinformation to flourish. I think it's the fault of the BBC and the New York Times that conservatives are so open to what Putin has to say. He's just taking advantage of a lack of institutional trust and a collective insanity that's gripped the most of our media institutions. Mm -hmm. well, give me, it's be interesting to ask you, give me the best pro-Russian argument you can right now. Like, try to sound more conservative than some of the conservatives that are defending Russia. And then share with me why you think that's mistaken. So, I think the, the the most interesting voices that have been critiquing the NATO position, shall yes, we say, yes. would be guys like Peter Hitchens, who say, look, there is actually a lot of nuance from the geopolitical perspective. Yeah. And I will, and, and you read my article, I'm very careful not to stray mm -hmm, into mm -hmm. areas where I don't know what I'm talking about. So when it comes to geopolitical strategy, for example, I have no idea if Poland giving them planes is upping the risk of nuclear war. 
I don't. Right. I not only don't have a comment, I don't have an opinion. And you don't necessarily I, have an opinion on America's involvement in the war. I don't because I do not understand. Yes. W- enough facts so like i get there's two views one is that if by supplying the ukrainians weapons they defeat russia a significant geopolitical enemy will basically be humiliated at a very low relative cost on the other hand that putin as a nuclear armed power could up the stakes Mm -hmm. and then end up you know end up turning into a direct confrontation i don't know which one of those are right they both seem reasonable to me but that's not my area of expertise so i'm not sure um, the most persuasive argument to me that still wouldn't be pro-Russia, but would be more sympathetic than most, would be Peter Hitchens pointing out that NATO is an organization created to restrain Russia, and that the aggressive expansion of yeah. NATO post the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, is one of the reasons that he felt compelled to invade, if he did in fact feel compelled. Um, it's interesting, Putin's also in his 70s now, and the the reason that makes him particularly dangerous is... He has all the palaces in the Black Sea he'll ever want. He's got more money than, you know, pretty much anybody in the world. All he cares about is legacy at this point, right? So he might actually do something extraordinarily insane and risky for somebody who's 40 and wants to hang on to power for 30 years, like Gaddafi did when he gave up his nuclear weapons, or even Saddam after after uh, the first Gulf War. When somebody's that old, they're thinking about history and legacy. They're not thinking about personal enrichment as much anymore. So I, I think a, a case could be made that the West has been needlessly provocative. But for me, I still don't understand how that results in the argument that they therefore have the right to invade a sovereign nation. Because although I do think it's provocative in some way for NATO to be playing footsies with Ukraine and attempting to kind of draw them into the EU-NATO orbit, I also don't think that gives Russia the right to invade and to do the things they've done. Like when I was there in September, I went to the mass graves in Bukha, like some horrifying things have been done there. But But, but these horrifying things that are done and are reported on are seen as suspect or probably not true. I know. I posted photographs of like bombed out buildings of interviews I was doing with real people. And people were like, I can't believe you fell for those fake pictures. I'm like, <laughs> I took those pictures myself. Like I got told by people that what I saw didn't actually happen. Like the burned out Russian tanks by the side of the road, like the high school that got bombed next to the Hostomol airport near Kiev. We went out to like to turn heave like, and my reporting on uh, on the Ukraine Russia war, I think, was very nuanced because I also, in my interviews with 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 people in the military, debunked some of the stories that were anti Russia. Mm. Like there was a couple of stories of specific atrocities going on uh, that I I tracked down soldiers and I asked them like, did this happen? And he said there was a video going on around on Telegram, but that's as much as we've gotten. It hasn't been confirmed, and I wrote that too. Um, cause with fog of war stuff, like the job of the Ukrainians is to convince everybody it's so terrible that they get more weapons. Yes. And so I a hundred percent believe yes. that they're hyperbolizing, they're exaggerating in certain instances, they're probably making some things up. Yep. Um, because Zelensky's glad handing for guns and he mm-hmm. needs to, con- he needs to sort of like prick people's consciences enough that they give him Abrams tanks. Right. So I get that that's what they're doing. But the underlying shift here with this discussion is that because, so we talked about how the West is dead. Mm-hmm is that Christians and conservatives in Western countries no longer feel much patriotism or loyalty to their own countries. I saw a t-shirt that said, I'd rather be with uh, Putin than with, than a Democrat or something. I've heard that. I've heard that more times than I can count. Yeah. Like I heard it last weekend. And so the difficulty is when you have Westerners who have lost faith in their own governments and worse, when you have Canadians and Americans who believe that their governments are an active force for evil in the world, when they believe the EU is an active force for evil in the world, the UN is an active force for evil in the, in the world, which I agree that now anybody our government opposes, like we also have to have a good guys and bad guys. It has to be binary. It doesn't need to. Like Putin can be a horrifying, like war crimes perpetrating leader and Joe Biden and Justin Trudeau can be decadent people whose policies pose an active physical threat to those struggling with mental illness or gender dysphoria or, or children in the womb. Both of those things can be true at the same time, but it's like us talking about entertainment. It's like, I think that Christians are going to have to get in the habit of just rejecting all of the options we're presented with. Yeah. And so that's why the answer to the, I'd mm -hmm. rather be with Putin than the Democrats is how about neither? Exactly. Yeah, it's a false dilemma. They're like, what do you, so what do you want? Do you want totalitarian dictatorship or do you want, you know, like aggressive decadence? Mm-hmm. Which one do you want? Well, maybe I don't want either. 1984 or Brave New World. Exactly. So it's, it's really difficult also because I think that a lot of, uh, of conservatives 
Conservatives have always been susceptible to the totalitarian temptation. And it's because when we see everything in society around us going to hell, the temptation is because we do fundamentally have some authoritarian instincts, mm -hmm. right? We believe in, in, in higher religious authority. We believe right. that our lives are supposed to be hemmed in by rules and standards and, and by scripture and things like that. And so when we see all this garbage happening, we're like, okay, so we need somebody in here to make all this illegal and make all of this stop. And so when we see somebody like Putin who, yeah, okay, he's invading Ukraine, but he's also banning a gay pride parade, the temptation is I want a strong leader who cleans mm -hmm. up the streets and makes the trains run on time and gets rid of all of this garbage. And that story is the story of the entire 20th century. It was always the binary. We need to back fascism to get rid of communism, or I need to actually, you know, make a partnership with the communists to beat the fascists. And again, I think the healthy Christian response would to be reject both camps because it's basically asking, do you want to get shot or poisoned? Mm. You said that you hold some views that conservatives would disagree with. This might be one of them. What else do you think that conservatives need to be careful about as they push back against the left? Or what are some errors you see people making that we need to stop making? It's a very big question. It is a big question. A like just, just, just because you, uh, mm. yeah, it, just because it might be fun to, what is the word? Like piss off the libs or something? <laughs> uh, own the libs. Own the yeah. libs rather. Yeah. yeah. Well, so what, one of my views is shaped by uh, a book written by Mary Aberstadt, who, uh, mm -hmm. if you've yeah. heard of her yet, so yes. she is, yes. I think, probably the foremost scholar on the sexual revolution writing today, I think. she, I call her the female Anthony Eslin once when I was chatting with her and instantly felt very embarrassed, but she took it as a compliment, <laughs> so I was relieved. <laughs> oh, good. Um, but she wrote an, a phenomenal book called How the West Really Lost God. Uh, I think the book is probably 15 years old now. A, a New Theory of Secularization. And basically, she, page by page, rebuts the traditional view of how our society became secular which is the, the Douglas Murray view, essentially, right? That, you know, scriptural criticism from the German school, um, the, you know, Darwinian evolution, all these things slowly eroded all of these, what Charles Taylor would call bulwarks of belief that had been unmovable and created the conditions in which we lost our faith. And as we lost our faith, we, you know, had the sexual revolution, whereas, you know, the Paris rioter said in 68, it's forbidden to forbid. Mm. She actually says that, that is not the case. Okay. And I I have completely bought into her argument. I've read the back and forth debate, but Let's her book it. has profoundly shaped my thinking on this. Okay. Is she says that actually the sexual revolution came first. That the sexual revolution came into a fundamentally Christian society where there had been all these like baby boomlets, where there had actually been a surge in church attendance and, and engagement with religious traditions. And that what the sexual revolution did was it broke apart the family, and the family is the vessel in which faith can flourish. And so secularism was actually brought about by the sexual revolution destroying the <clears throat> fundamental foundation that faith needs to exist in a society, especially institutional churches. And so the reason I find this theory so interesting, that it's actually the sexual revolution that predicates the, or sort of predates um, um, widespread secularism and the worship of self is because that actually has a political application that I think uh, Viktor Orban is trying in Hungary right now, where what he's attempting to do is using government policy to orient the economy towards the family and create the conditions in which family can flourish. So not sort of white hot free market vulture capitalism, but creating the conditions in which the, all, all policy benefits Mm -hmm. Young people getting together, getting married, and raising a bunch of kids. Yes. Right? So their divorce rate has been like half. Their their abortion rate has been plummeting year over year for, for like seven years now. I interviewed the family minister of Hungary for the American conservative. She's now, I think, the president of Hungary. Yes. But she kind of, Catalan Novak. Yeah, she was, that's right. She, she, was started, here at the, she was here at the university speaking recently. Did you go see her? Oh, I wasn't awesome. here, I unfortunately. Her. But I am going to Hungary soon, and I'm, I'm going to try to set up an interview with her. Absolutely. So she basically details all these things they're doing. And what's interesting is it's not working on, a, on the scale I'd like to see it working, but it's working significantly enough to mean we should give those policies a second look. Because if we're looking at the, the rebuilding of society, and we all recognize that religious revival is something divinely orchestrated that we cannot trigger or bring about. On the other hand, if Mary Aberstadt is right, and that the sexual revolution's destruction of the family is what predates secularism, then a society oriented towards the rebuilding of the family can create the conditions, I think, mm. for religious practice, practice pardon me, to become normative again. 
And so when you see in Hungary the divorce rate plummeting, the abortion rate plummeting, they basically said that and, you know, anybody who has a kid, half their student debt is forgiven. You have a second kid, all of your student debt is forgiven. If you have four kids and you're a woman, you'll never have to pay income tax again for the rest of your life. Because the most interesting polling uh, sets coming from both Canada but other European countries is that women are having fewer children than they say they want. Which is really, really interesting. And they're referring to all these different economic conditions uh, that have led to their decision to have fewer children, whether by contracepting or by aborting. And one of the things Hungary found, just to show you the depth and the precision of their research, is that a lot of people would stop three kids because then they'd have to upgrade to a minivan. Mm -hmm. And that was too big of an expense because they couldn't fit three car seats into one car. And so now they have a family tax credit to get a minivan so that families can buy a minivan more easily. And so for me, uh, Mary Aberstadt's, the political application of Mary Aberstadt's theory of secularization of the sexual revolution has led me to see government policy not oriented towards everybody has all freedom all the time mm -hmm. to do whatever they want. But instead, I am very, very interested in the experiment going on in Hungary and a couple of other places. And if it continues to work the way it's working, I think that policies like that should be adopted by other countries because we can't put the family back together, but we can create the conditions for some young man in Steubenville who wants to get married, but sees life is so brutally expensive. There's so many economic roadblocks to him doing right. the thing that his great grandfather would have been able to do without thinking about it, to buy a house on one income, to right. have a bunch of kids, right? To have a two car garage. So um, these, so these policies can till the hardened earth yes. in order to make uh, yes. sort of planting the seeds of family be, be more yes. hospitable. Yeah. Because there are an enormous number of people based on all the data we have that want to start a family that, that like, like, you know, all the rad trad memes and all sort of the trad wife stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who find that attractive, but mm -hmm. also see it as unattainable. Mm. And these policies, the policies in Hungary are making it attainable for a significant percentage of the population. And so, here's where you get conservatives saying, but free market, I don't really care because I'm the kind of conservative who looks at what I want to conserve and wants to actually move to towards that. that. Yes. And so I don't, I don't have any like scriptural or Christian attachment to free market economics <laughs> at all. Yes. And I hate libertarianism because I think it's like libertinism that's dressed up to be palatable. And Mary Aberstadt said that libertarianism is moonshine straight up. Very few people can actually handle it. Hmm. The people who can handle it are the rich people at the top. Yeah, libertarianism makes sense when you live, say, in Canada, and people want to come in, override yes. the parents' rights, and euthanize your child. Libertarianism a sudden, is a response to a threat. Yeah. It's not an ideology that actually gets us to where we want to go as a culture or as a subculture. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about subcultures, these are the kinds of policies that could actually till the ground and create the conditions <clears throat> in which these subcultures could actually flourish. Not just be yeah. possible, but flourish. So this is an interesting conversation because we've gone from admitting that the West is dead, mm -hmm. just leave it alone, to tremendous hope, right? Like there's a lot of hope here. It sounds like we're, we might not be at the end of the bucket right now. Right. There's probably a long way to go. But that we're seeing people, you can only drink your own crap for so long, <laughs> to use an analogy <laughs> that no one has ever used, <laughs> uh, before... It's like you can keep doing it and we can all die or we can. Well, I think uh, that my response to that would be the West is dead. Long live the West. Yeah. Is the West as we knew it is dead, but it's our responsible. You're married. We have kids and we have to ask ourselves, like, how do we rebuild among the ruins? How do we create a subculture in which our children can live healthy, fulfilled lives? How, how can we protect them from the storytellers? Of the culture? How do we create a parallel social imaginary that passes on our values and refuses to allow them to be inculcated into the old values? And so the West is dead, but the inheritance that the West has has simply been rejected by multiple generations. We can pick that up whenever we want to, right? That's why Anthony Eslin calls the classics the unused artillery of the culture wars, is it's all still right there. Nobody's, the government's not stopping you from reading Heidi to your kids. Right or Laura Ingalls Wilder or any mm -hmm. of the great classics of American literature that teach mm -hmm. beautiful things about Sabbath observance and family life and living a virtuous they, life. They may be rewritten soon, as Dr. Seuss was. Yeah, but do buy physical copies. Right now, <laughs> that's right. I don't remember her being a raging lesbian. Blue hair, too. Yeah, they made Joe March from Little Woman uh, a lesbian in one new version. To be fair, yeah. Dr. Seuss has had blue hair for a while. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing that you brought up, you changed my mind on this, and that's the idea that UFC is something that, that we should be okay with. Um, 
And I, I brought this up on the Yes or No show with Michael Knowles the mm. other day because I think your argument's excellent. I like watching two people mm -hmm. beat the snot out of each other. It seems enjoyable, but I don't like that I like that. Mm -hmm. Give us your argument against UFC and boxing. So my, my basic argument on on, Uf, on UFC and boxing and, and most and cage fighting and, and sort of everything in that category would simply be that we do not have any right to physically maul and injure somebody for entertainment purposes. That's right. There are absolutely... There are like reasons, men, yes, but money should be and ready to do violence that, yeah. on behalf of, uh, of their loved ones. So self-defense training, learning how to use all of those fighting mechanisms, absolutely doing it for training purposes, for military purposes, for law enforcement purposes, all of that. But to like physically do damage to one another, which is the point of the sport, specifically for the purpose of entertaining a mob, that if you look at the people screaming and cheering, it's always chanting blood, and like they get most excited when somebody's head's bouncing up and down. I think it's pornographic in the real sense of the term. And I think it's coarsening, and it's morally deadening, and I enjoy it for all of the reasons that you decided. I find it endlessly fascinating, but for all of the wrong reasons. Because you were actually sort of glorifying and kind of getting off on two people perpetrating violence against each other because we like to see it. And so the response argument always is it takes tremendous skill. Yep. Of course, most of those guys could pop my head like a right pimple. Like I have no <laughs> doubt that they're tremendously talented people, <laughs> but all kinds of people are tremendously talented at doing things that mm -hmm. I don't think Assassins are more justifiable. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Uh, the, the, Counter example that's often brought up and which Michael Knowles brought up against me to challenge my view was that of football. My answer, and I want to hear yours, is that just because there might be some uh, sports that I don't know mm -hmm. whether they fit into this category of being unacceptable or not doesn't mean I can't decide what is unacceptable. It's the right. old fallacy of the beard. Yes, yes, where yes. Just yes, because yes. I don't know when a beard begins mm -hmm. doesn't mean I can't say what a beard is. Mm -hmm. I feel that way with pornography as well. I can demonize pornography. And there can be some morally, or let's say gray areas rather, where I'm not sure if this fits into that, that category of, of the pornographic or not. But it doesn't mean I can't know what the pornographic is. Mm -hmm. What's your view on football? Uh, I think football largely and by fits. football, just so everybody knows, mm. we have a worldwide audience here. Mm. I mean, I guess rugby, uh, yeah. but also um, NFL. So I could be persuaded other, uh, in either direction, but I will say that the, the American football industry... I think is fundamentally it, it it's a distinctive net negative on American culture writ large, right? Conservatives have this thing where they tune on to Super Bowl Sunday when they should be at church. Um, and then what they do is they'll watch the Super Bowl halftime show and then predictably get outraged. And then they go on Twitter and can you believe, of course I can believe it. They've been doing it for as long as I'm alive. And so like the whole spectacle, I think, is just sort of a decadent and hedonistic celebration of human violence, um, exhibitionist sexuality and Sabbath breaking. And that's my short answer. Uh, m fair enough. Uh, Matt Walsh recently said that we need these sports. We need boxing. We need football because it takes male aggression and channels it in a healthy way. What's your response to that? You don't need to do that as a spectator sport, though, because you can do, you can get fat drinking beer and eating chips on a Sunday morning watching it uh, on TV. It's not doing anything for you. If he's making the case that sports are good for boys, I agree. If he's making the case that boys should be trained in self-defense, should learn boxing or mixed martial arts or Krav Maga, I totally support that as well. So I support the premise of his argument. I would just say it doesn't apply to professional football. But isn't it a little inconsistent to say that I'm against boxing as a spectator sp mm -hmm. sport, but I am okay with my son learning it, and yet he's going to be learn in order to learn mm -hmm. it efficiently, he's going to have to get hurt? That really depends, because I do think that good coaches uh, ensure that people don't get physically damaged and don't actually sustain permanent damage. Um, I, but somebody I, I, who's, who's, who's preparing for an actual fight mm -hmm. where something's on the line is going to be a lot more prepared to engage in a real fight than somebody who's in a ring knowing he can't actually get that hurt. True. And so I will admit that I don't know enough about... So when we're talking about boxing and mixed martial arts... Um, I have a lot of buddies who, who went through it and did the training and have learned all these things. I don't actually know what the rate of injury is afterwards mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, I do think that like males especially can take physical risks to gain a skill that is useful and, and, that, um, and will help them um, protect and defend the vulnerable. I think it's different when it becomes a spectator sport, though. 
Um, like if the same two people were fighting in a ring explicitly for the purposes of training, I think that would be different because they wouldn't be doing it for entertainment purposes. I see. I don't think two males fighting is always wrong. I do think that like, you know, physically hurting each other for the entertainment of a mob is what I object to yeah. fundamentally. It is a spectator sport. Well, one of the reasons that cock, uh, fighting and bear baiting <laughs> was, uh, sorry, did I pause too much after cock? <laughs> one of the reasons too much. <laughs> <laughs> cock fighting and bear baiting was banned. Wasn't just because of animal cruelty, yeah. but because it vulgarized the masses. Like yep. what kind of person will you be if you get into or get off on watching roosters tear each other to shreds. Like, what kind of man well, does that make you? And UFC doesn't seem to be... So when we're talking about football, UFC, entertainment, porn, and then we say, where do we draw the line? Like Again, I, I find this to be an interesting question because I feel like 50 years ago, most devout Christians who cared about building virtue would find, them, find it much easier to answer. And I think that our hesitancy to answer some questions that I think are kind of obvious are simply are because we don't want to give the stuff up. So what we what we actually are trying to do is how close can I get to the danger zone and it still be morally acceptable rather than how far can I go away from this in the direction of pursuing other good, true and beautiful things. Um, and I don't know, I just find I find a lot of the arguments like so all of the arguments that we have about really morally deadening entertainment. I don't think they're that difficult. Actually, yeah. I think they're difficult because we've, we've chosen to make them difficult. Mm. Whereas the question ought to be, how faithful can I be to the word of God, huh? Yeah, and, and who am I when I watch? Why do I like watching UFC? That's right, yeah. I mean, you're always going to get, you know, some guy who's like, well, I think it's physical chess and it's great. And, you know, I'm sure there's a few. I'm sure there's a few people who can who can view graphic sex scenes in movies and not have it bother them that much. I don't think that's a... I don't, arguing from the exception is how we got mm. legal abortion and pretty much everything else. So I don't think it's a good argument. Yeah. Let's take a break. And then when we come back, we're going to take some questions from our local supporters and super chatters. So I'm if you're here watching right now and you're a local supporter, I'm about to make a post that's just exclusive to you. And uh, we'll, we'll do our best to get to all of your questions. Thanks so much. So if you haven't yet got the app Hallo, what are you doing? If you have a smartphone, go and download Hallo. But first, go to hallo.com slash Matt Frad. Hallo is the number one Catholic prayer and meditation app on the web. And it's fantastic. And it actually beat TikTok recently, as far as in the app store. Did you know that? It's crazy. No, it's legit. Hallo.com slash Matt Frad. Go over there, sign up. You'll get three months for free. If at the end of the three months you don't want it anymore, you can quit and you don't have to pay a cent. They have sleep stories. They'll help you pray the rosary. It's really fantastic. Also, if you've got kids, it's nice to play uh, little sleep stories for them. Hallo, H-A-L-L-O-W dot com slash Matt Frad, click the link in the description below. I want to say thank you to a new sponsor, everythingcatholic.com. Maybe you like Amazon, but you're tired of giving them money. What if you could give your money to a Catholic company that sold everything Catholic and in so doing not only support that Catholic company, but support Catholic artisans and craftsmen as well. I've got a bunch of stuff that they just so sent me. We have a chrism scented bee wax candle, which Thursday thinks smells delightful. We even have Chrism Lotion Cream. They have rosary bracelets. They have kids' books. They have... What is this? This is like a Mary doll for your children. Rosaries, kids' books, all sorts of stuff. Go to everythingcatholic.com right now. And when you use the promo code PINTS, you'll get 15% off. So go support an excellent Catholic company, as well as, as I say, excellent Catholic small businessmen and craftsmen. Everythingcatholic.com.
All right, we're back. I want to address this Tennessee school shooting that took place yesterday, I believe. It was at a Christian school. The shooter, 28-year-old, transgender, quote-unquote. So it was a, a woman who mistakenly thinks that she's a man. And uh, it's believed that this person tried to target a Christian school, like was targeting a Christian school. Thoughts? Have you heard about this? Yeah, so I, I, it's it's kind of wild because when the story first came out and it was a male, they said it was a male shooter. Gosh. And I thought, okay, like that makes more sense. But then they say it's female. Like yeah. it's it's very, it's very. vanishingly rare that a female does a, perpetrates a school shooting. But I think part of this would have to do with the rhetoric. Like I wrote a column last week or the week before on uh, one of these major trans uh, TikTok influencers, I think. Anyways, a social media influencer who's basically talking to young trans people and saying, like, this is literally genocide. Um, there was a story yeah. two days ago saying, like, red states are uh, are denying trans people their existence and all these kinds of things. And with, with rhetoric saying, like, we're literally being killed, we're literally dying, we're literally suffering from a genocide. I see. It was only really a matter of time before somebody decided to react like, you know, that mm. was in fact happening. God That's horrifying, you. though. Yeah. God I hadn't realized these people. when it's a school shooting and it's a, so this is this is. Just to get the facts right, this isn't somebody who's like in her late twenties. Twenty eight. So shooting she's, like nine year olds. She's twenty eight. The she and she's dead. Um twenty eight. Yeah, six dead, three adults, three nine year old children. Yeah. Reports um, just, indicate shooter possessed maps of the school indicating a premeditated planned attack. The pastor wow. who runs the church that run the school, his own nine year old daughter was lost in the shooting. Oh, Lord Jesus. Um, there was... This is also, just real quick, and then I'll... Yeah, go for it. Shut up about... Um, but this, I believe, and I was trying to confirm this last night because mm -hmm. I was prepping this stuff for yeah. Matt to have ready. But if I remember right, and I saw some like things in passing when I was looking through this, this is the second time in the last four years. Well, this is... The fourth shooter in the last four years that has identified as trans. Really? That's been a mass shooter. Colorado Springs at the uh, the gay bar. Right. Um, and then there was another, um, and I couldn't find I couldn't find the details, but I do know this. I do remember this. Mm -hmm. That there was another female shooter who identified as male who was on testosterone. Oh. Um, mm. And we also have people as recently as like Jane Fonda on the View saying that the solution to people like the pro-lifers right. taking away yeah like she backtracked that comment but it wasn't very convincing alx on twitter uh is sharing a conversation that took place between a reporter and a police officer the reporter says do you have any reason to believe that how she identifies has any motive for targeting the school the police officer said there is some theory to that the reporter said so was this a targeted attack the police officer says it was Gosh, there's so many ways to just butcher this right now. Um, Isn't there something like particularly like gut wrenching about the idea of a woman shooting kids? To go back to our earlier comment, I think there's something particularly gut wrenching about watching women destroy each other in a ring for sport. There's particularly gut wrenching about that. Yes, this is disgusting. This is despicable. This is how else to say it? Just uh, sad enough to make you lose sleep. Not to mention these poor mothers and fathers who lost their children. Yeah. But see, what this is going to become now is the right harping on the fact that this was someone who's transgender and the left saying we need gun control. Mm -hmm. well, well, they're already blaming Tennessee. They're already blaming Daily Wire. I saw it on Twitter. They yeah. pointed out that this is in Nashville. This is where all the anti-trans Daily Wire hosts are from. Yeah, everybody's going to make a mess of it almost immediately. And then both the left and the right are going to complain about the other side gaslighting them. Yeah. What's, what's our response? to this what's our christian response to this other than prayers for the repose of these souls and justice to be done i one of the things i have not yet figured out is when is the right time in the wake of a tragedy that is so horrific and it's always more horrific when it involves little kids like when is the right time to actually write a commentary pointing out the political implications of it yeah. i just don't know yeah because it feels like it it it, it feels ghoulish to be like, okay, I write about gender ideology all the time, which yeah. I do, to, you know, hop right back on the blog or, you know, write for an, a, a magazine, an article on how, see, this is about their rhetoric and stuff like that. I don't know. It feels, 
it feels disrespectful. I don't think it necessarily is, but I don't know. I just it, it feels very hard to know what the right thing to do when it, it's, it's nine year olds who got shot. Like yeah. they're just they're the little kids. Yeah, we got another um, tweet here from End Wokeness. And this person points out not a single headline says the word Christian, transgender, or targeted. And this is from, he's looking at papers from the New York Times, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, and Wall Street Journal. Yeah, well, you'll remember when all of those uh, Christians got uh, got killed over Easter Sunday, and then Obama and Hillary tweeted out that Easter worshipers had been killed, <laughs> right? Like, they'll bend over backwards to avoid portraying Christians as victims, because Christians cannot be victims, because in the culture wars, Christians are those with the oppressive ideology that's creating victims instead. Now, as somebody who's from America but lives in Canada, what is your opinion on gun control? I actually don't have any strong opinions on on gun control at all. I like I I uh, I was I'm the kind of guy who got licensed to get a handgun and a long gun and everything in Canada, and then just forgot to buy one for but, like but five wouldn't years. Be, wouldn't now be a great time for Canadian citizens to have some chance against people coming in to oh, euthanize sure. their children? Yep. yep. I just don't have a strong um, opinion on. So after these shootings always happen, everybody's like, "It's guns, it's mental illness, it's this, it's that." I don't know what the right answer to that question is because you do go to other countries uh, where you know. Guns are still available, and there's less of them. At the same time, you can't just say it's American culture because American culture is global culture now. They're, you know, they they export right. the same video games, the same yep. TV shows, the same movies. So we even wear in Australia American sports team hats. <laughs> are you serious? Yeah, like NBA yeah. and NFL. So yeah, I, I don't know what the differences there are, and I feel like the same you know four positions are put forward every time there's a mass shooting, and I just genuinely have no idea which one's right. Yeah. Well, God, God have mercy. One of the biggest victories in the culture war that mm -hmm. we've seen in the last, what, well, since the sexual revolution mm -hmm. has been the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. uh, if it can be overturned, can't it be re-overturned? And is this something we should celebrate? Obviously, it's something we should celebrate, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. is it something that we should have hope for uh, in, the, in the distant future mm -hmm. that this isn't just going to be turned again? Yeah, so I feel like we've had several conversations after we declared the West dead that indicate that, you know, it might be worth slapping the paddles to. I was referring <laughs> yes. to cult culture specifically, yes. but with, with, I think that, so Ro the overturn of Roe v. Wade on, on June 24, 2022 was many things. I, I actually uh, went to D.C. with my wife and we went to the front of the Supreme Court while the corpse of Roe was still fresh and the protests were still raging. And one of the most significant things, I think, from an even international perspective is it is true that the sexual revolution has never received a blow like that. And because so many people thought the overturn of Roe was impossible, mm -hmm. the pro-life movement in the United States has been declared dead a handful <laughs> of times in my lifetime. Yes. Right? It was declared dead when the Human, human Life Amendment failed in the 80s. It was declared dead after the FACE Act came in and Operation Rescue got shut down. Then it was declared dead and when I actually thought that it might all be over, at least in terms of the overturn of Roe, was when Obama got reelected. And we all thought he'd get like two or three more justices. And yeah. this was going to be the law of the land for a generation. Uh, and then Roe v. Wade was overturned. And one of it's the only time I've enjoyed reading the left-wing press in years. Because like the Guardian, the New York Times, the Washington Post were all saying things like, if Roe v. Wade can be overturned, what else is possible? And I'm like, what a <laughs> yeah. pleasant thing to think about. <laughs> right? like, Thank let's you go for down that, that rabbit trail for a bit. So I do think that, that like, the encouragement uh, that a lot of other pro-life movements in other countries got, I, I'm in contact regularly with pro-life groups from all over the world. And one of the significant things a lot of Latin American and South American pro-life leaders said is that if if America, the sort of globalist blob that's exporting abortion and LGBT rights all over the world, which goes back to why a lot of Americans don't feel patriotic anymore, if America can overturn Roe v. Wade, can say, as Samuel Alito explicitly did, abortion is not a constitutional right, if he can say that, then why are they telling us that we have to legalize abortion? Why are they ruling uh, that abortion must be legalized because it's a fundamental human right? And then you actually had one Planned Parenthood, international Planned Parenthood employee say, this is a set back our work in Africa and Latin America decades. Praise God. And so it, it was Your work just, is evil. I was very irritated by those who felt like, no, we should cautiously celebrate. I'm like, absolutely not. <laughs> 
Everybody should be having the best weekend they've had in decades. This is an unambiguously phenomenal thing. Yeah, this was uh, this this happened on my daughter's birthday on our way to a trampoline park, and we celebrated together. And that's amazing. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing too. It was. I mean, talk about if culture means a life lived in common. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful thing in Steubenville for people to celebrate together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's your thoughts on Steubenville? You've been here what? 10 hours? <laughs> Roughly. <laughs> Thursday gave me a bit of a tour. The, yeah. the, the cigar lounge is just phenomenal. Those floors Thank and you. the ceiling. It looks yes, fantastic. Yes, and I recognize all the paintings on the wall. Good, good, good. That, yeah. was, that was very neat. But this this is the sort of thing that we're talking about with subculture. Is It's very... We've talked a, b a bunch about how subculture should look, but intentionality, I think, is a huge one. You talked uh, earlier about moving into the ruins and setting yeah. up shop. We did that literally here. I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't have said that before you did, but <laughs> yes. I saw the massive rusting steel mills, what, four of them or something the, like that? The shadow yep. of the American steel machine. Yeah, the shadow of the American steel machine. But what I really yep. appreciate about what everybody's doing here is the intentionality. They're recognizing that to create what what is called a thick community, that you actually need to be very intentional about that. It's so these common working spaces, these places where people can gather. Mm -hmm. um, those things... Um, are very present here and it's obviously been well thought out for those reasons. So it's really, really cool to see communities like this forming. And I hope this is something we see happening right across the United States, Canada, yeah. and elsewhere. Yeah. It, it is beautiful to see. And one of the things I love about living in Steubenville is basically we just, everyone picks a feast day and has a house party on that day. <laughs> and also like the liturgical calendar lines up perfectly with the gray months. How big is the community here? How many people would you say have moved here over the last two years? If you could give it, if you were like putting, if people there was money or on families. it. families. Because if I yeah. had to guess families, then I would have let's to say, do let's like say some people. math. Let's say people. There's a lot of people that have moved oh, to town. People. If you had to put money on it. So we're not being hyperbolic. We're trying to be realistic. Are we doing, are we doing a Price is Right style where I have to be close without going over? Or do uh, I just have, should I hyperbolize it a little? No, I think close without going over. Because I, I, I fear that sometimes maybe I... Uh... Uh, I would get... So fam if people and not families. So I would say we've got at least... Jacob has told me... The, the last number Jacob told me was 14, maybe 20. Um, families? Families. And I'd say they on average have <laughs> five children. members each. <laughs> right. Because they average have three kids. Yeah. Some of them have none and yeah. some of them have more. Yeah. So, so I mean... Six, seven, eight hundred people? I wouldn't go that far. I was going to say like two to three hundred, yeah, hmm. Catholics within the last two years, probably since I moved. We keep move. We keep meeting people. Thank I think buying up the downtown. Part of the blame is this show because we keep talking about Steubenville. I keep meeting people who say I just moved here because of what you said on the show. Seriously, are you serious? Yes, <laughs> I think it's because people have a lot more flexibility with their work these mm. days that they did prior to COVID lockdowns. Right, right. We even had a couple. They were like, "We just moved here from Hawaii." I'm like, "Oh god, why? You're gonna hate me in February." You're going to just... <laughs> You're from Luke, Hawaii. Luke, yeah. Luke works in the, the yeah. co-working space downstairs. Yep. And you remember a couple of weeks ago when it was like 56? <laughs> he was still, when he went out to have his smokes, wearing his winter coat. And he came back in one day and I went, dude, you are really from... Ho like, it's it's 50 degrees out. Why are you still wearing a winter coat? He's like, it's cold when the wind blows. <laughs> yep. I mean, part of it is, I think, setting up shop by a good Christian university, which is what mm -hmm. we've done here, right? So you necessarily have families who are committed to being here, right? fresh blood coming in, mm -hmm. you know, university students coming. So it's it's been really good to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's very Yeah, neat. and I really I try, to, try to say whenever I bring up Steubenville that I'm really, really not saying you should move here, but find somewhere like this. It, it's It's... Like our children just have so many families that they accidentally bump into and are being uh, influenced mm -hmm. by in a good way. No, and that's one of the reasons you do need communities because, like, you 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 do this uh, talking about porn all the time, but your mm -hmm. kids can get shown porn on like the public playground and stuff like that yeah. if you're not careful, right? Like, you do have to create sort of a community e <clears throat> ethos where you're collectively committed to keeping this sort of trash out, so your kid's not the only one without a smartphone. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. Or that they're not just learning the culture from other kids who are still participating in the, the mainstream. I, I wanted to revisit this topic of what Dennis Prager and Jordan Peterson and Jonathan mm. Pajot said. And I'm not mm. sure how much of that clip that you watched. I watched the whole thing. Right. So basically, Dennis's point was that if somebody is using... Well, he began by saying that he cares about the interior much less mm -hmm. than the rest of you do, he said. Now, look... 
I run a talk show like mm -hmm. this. I can't tell you how many times I wish I phrased things differently mm -hmm. or even changed my mind. And mm -hmm. now that thing lives in infamy. So I really want to give Dennis the opportunity to perhaps rephrase, right. to rethink. OK, because he's said a lot of things that I agree with. I respect him a great deal. But I think beginning with that point that he cares a lot less about the interior. And I thought, well, thank thank God that for Christianity, mm -hmm. thank God for Jesus, who wants our hearts to be in line with the truth, not just our actions. If I have a child who has all these evil thoughts mm -hmm. about, say, racist evil thoughts or thoughts about harming other people, I'm not satisfied if he just doesn't act on them. Right. I want the good to become easy for him. Mm -hmm. I want him to love the good, not just obey the good out mm -hmm. of some sort of obligation. But he then said in regards to pornography, and I do think he was kind of put on the spot here. Right. And I'm not sure what kind of editing went on, uh, you know, unintentionally perhaps. But he said that if a man uses pornography as a substitute for marital relations with his wife, this is awful. He said if a man uses pornography as a substitute for adultery, it's not awful. Well, I think both are awful. And mm -hmm. I know you've spoken a lot about pornography. I have too. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? So the most charitable interpretation of, of what Dennis Prager said, I thought, is that he simply doesn't understand what pornography is in 2023. Mm -hmm. So he talks about, you know, um, like looking at pictures yeah, man and looking imagining, at a photo. Yeah. yeah, which like when my, my dad sat me down when I was 13 and warned me against looking at porn, that's what he was warning me about. Don't look at these magazines. Like I see, you know, old Playboys and Hustlers now and antique bookstores being sold as sort of like novelty items because we've moved so far past that <laughs> right. era. Whereas I wonder what Dennis Prager would do again, because like I've, I've listened to a lot of his stuff. And so I want to treat him as a, a, an ally who's gone astray as opposed to somebody that I shred. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder what he would say if he'd read that essay in the Atlantic last year, where 24% of American women between the ages of 18 and 34 reported being choked during intimacy as a result of porn or the report uh, from one of the UK education ministers saying that kids as young as 12 were being choked during sexual play. So one kids that young were engaging in sexual play. And then two, they were actually engaging in these kinds of behaviors and that this is now rapidly becoming the norm that, right. that fundamentally what pornography has done is it's reshaped our minds. And as such, it's mainstreamed the idea of sexual violence in, in the romantic context, which, of course, um, you know better than anybody because you've spoken on this all over the place. When I speak on porn, one of the things I want to emphasize is that it's not just spiritually corrosive, which it is, but it's also going to make your mind like physically, physiologically unsuited for what will actually bring you happiness, a real marriage, a real relationship. And that because of like, I, I see pornography the same way I see uh, TikTok or other social media platforms. It's a persuasion technology. Because it reshapes the way that we think. It actually, you know, um, like transforms our mind to be aroused and attracted to things that our conscience and our reason may tell us are reprehensible and vile. But at the same time, our body is screaming for them because we've trained our brains to be attracted to these things. And the moment for me that the violence that was becoming prevalent in pornography broke through the mainstream in Canada was we had this... Uh, uh, famous for Canada host on the CBC, which would be our, our state broadcaster, state funded broadcaster. Um, and he got accused of sexual assault by 13 or 14 women. Um, and he came out with a statement where he accepted that he'd done all those things. Yeah. He had choked, he had hit, he'd done all this kind of stuff. And he said, I had a 50 shades of gray relationship. Basically it was consensual, which is when a guy says that kind of thing is consensual. He's basically saying, yeah, I did, but she was asking for it. And, then what shocked me, though, was not that he'd said this, because we're kind of used to celebrities doing that sort of thing these days, especially post Me Too. But there was an article uh, in the Toronto Star, which is Canada's largest and, and most left wing newspaper, which said uh, Gian Gomeshi has been accused of unwanted sexual violence, mm. like unwanted sexual violence, mm. inherently affirming this idea that sexual mm. violence is now permissible. Yes. And so what I do when I give talks on porn is I get the teenagers to submit written questions to me so yep, they actually will you know yep, ask what ask they want to ask yep. and i don't know what your experience is like but the number of questions i get from like 13 14 15 year old girls who are like my boyfriend is asking me to do this yes my boyfriend is asking me to do that a lot of it's unnatural it's violent it's degrading it's horrifying stuff and these are young kids and this is all learned behavior so i feel like the the people who were addicted to porn even 15 years ago were usually introduced to, to it as teens now most 
kids are introduced to it five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. And so their brains actually never get the opportunity to be shaped by any real wholesome, healthy view of sexuality. And what we're having is a generation of young men grow up with fundamentally deformed brains who yep. see sexuality as something that is based fundamentally cannibalistic and inherently violent. Yeah. And if people want more proof of this, I, not to be too self-promotional, but you should mm. get my book, The Porn, Porn Myth. It's a non-religious response to pro-porn mm. arguments. I don't make a cent from the sales of the book. 100% of the royalties go to help sex traffic victims in San Diego. Um, but when I gave that book to Trent, he read the section I had on what former porn performers mm. were saying about their experience. He said he almost threw up. Yep. It was it was that bad. And and these women certainly got left out of the discussion on mm -hmm. this Exodus show. And with, you know, Again, I'm not picking on them. This, this is a big topic, and they weren't planning, perhaps, on having a whole discussion on pornography. Charitably speaking, I just don't think he knew the stuff that we're talking about right now. And to be clear, if all pornography was, was one single photo of one single single woman, it would still be, in my yes. estimation, an evil thing because it perverts the conjugal act. Mm -hmm. And so uh, so Dennis, is, Dennis gave a, a sympathetic or a, 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 what would you say, a heart moving story of a man who was looking after his bedridden wife like a saint. And wouldn't it be OK for him to then look at? Yes, it, it would be wrong. Mm -hmm. It would be wrong. Yeah. So, no, yeah. it wouldn't be OK. Yes, it would be. It yeah. would be wrong. Um it's important, I think, to, to point out a couple of things. Just because something is less bad than something else, mm -hmm. it doesn't make that thing good. Uh, if I smoke mm -hmm. a packet of cigarettes a day, smoking my cigar here, instead of a carton, mm -hmm. that's less bad, mm -hmm. but it doesn't make it healthy. It, feel free to jump in there. No, I just think that one of the things he was doing was he's so articulate about why leftist arguments are so often finding a loophole and then, you know, driving a, col a whole culture through it. Mm -hmm. And then what does he do? He picks an extreme example that tugs at the heartstrings yeah. and then says, why would it be wrong for him? This is <laughs> right, the way right, that right. the suicide activists brought in assisted yep. suicide. It's why n nobody talks about abortion without bringing up a 12 year old victim of sexual assault. They bring up examples that genuinely appeal to our empathy, but I think it exploits our empathy and our compassion in order to bring in an evil that will fundamentally destroy many people and society yes. that's right another thing i think he seemed to misunderstand or at least it wasn't and this is what i'd like to do if he does come on the show next month to talk about this is um there is a distinction that needs to be made between sexual desire and lust mm. in thomas aquinas's commentary in matthew's gospel where our lord says if you look upon a woman with lust you've already committed adultery with her in your heart, he makes a distinction between what he calls a pro-passion and a passion. He says a pro-passion is when we feel sexual arousal, mm -hmm. but merely in a sensual way in which the intellect is not yet engaged. And then he distinguishes that from a passion in which we are now engaging uh, the reason. That distinction has to be made. If you don't realize that there's a difference between feeling sexual mm -hmm. arousal and then, say, fantasizing about what you could do to this woman sexually... If there's no distinction mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. then obviously it seems insane to condemn lust because lust is outside of your control. And maybe this is why a lot of people think it's impossible to be pure because they think lust is the same thing as sexual desire, but it's not. But did you get the sense from watching that clip, because I certainly did, that he'd never really thought about the issue particularly deeply? Because all of his responses were very pragmatic, like this is the way the world is. He, he said at one mm. point, men like diversity. And it, it just didn't seem like a very well thought out position. It seemed like a, yeah. just a response to reality. I would agree with you if he hadn't have begun with, I've been saying this for years. Still, I think he hasn't been thinking about it yeah. for years. Well, maybe that's true. And maybe he will now that he's uh, getting pushed back. And uh, that would be great. Um, I do think it was unfortunate the Daily Wire clipped that because that was that was not a that was not a flattering clip to say the least. Yeah, they were probably attempting to be provocative because yeah. it certainly would have triggered a lot well, of discussion. Definitely did that. Because yeah. like Ben <laughs> Shapiro wrote a book called The Porn Generation. Yeah, but was that about pornography, or was that more about peripherally? Peripherally, yeah. yeah. And Walsh and Knowles talk about pornography quite a bit. And I don't think we're going to see them comment on this. I doubt it. Because Prager U, don't they have a deal with the Daily well, it's Wire? Not, like they it wasn't them. on Prager U, it was on Daily Wire. Oh, yeah, right. That's the thing. <laughs> so it's like, it would be nice. It would be nice to see that. Because I, I, one of the things I do respect about Daily Wire is they do allow a healthy disagreement yes. between commentators. Yeah. And they definitely have different views. Yes, very much so. Um, so I, it would be nice to see that. Mm -hmm. All right, we got some questions here. Um, if we get any kind of super chats or even interesting questions, feel free to yeah. slack them to me or let me know. But we have a 
a question here from Paul Landhoud, who is a local supporter. He says, hi, Matt, enjoying the interview. Can you ask Jonathan if he has looked into Syriac Christian lifestyle? His description of lifestyle seems very similar to it. So the only uh, uh, research I've ever done to the Syriac Christian communities is that they're currently under threat in most yeah. places where they still exist. But uh, as for their lifestyles, besides watching some fascinating videos of their liturgy, I can't claim to know much uh, much else about them. Now, Which I did. You're a Protestant Christian. Yes, Reformed. Yeah. Uh, Reformed. I'm a Catholic Christian. Why is it important that we link arms here? Uh, it, it's certainly the case, I think, that, uh, that brothers fight more viciously, mm -hmm. you know, and, and maybe how, how do we draw the line between disagreeing and mm -hmm. trying to kind of call each other to our side, as mm -hmm. it were, if we believe our side's in the truth, which hopefully we do, or else we wouldn't mm -hmm. be in that side, and linking arms and fighting these cultural wars. So Francis Schaeffer, who is yeah. the guy who brought a lot of Protestants into the pro-life movement, has a great term he calls us co-belligerents. <laughs> but there's so many of these issues that we mm. are on the right side of that we can fight together on. But in terms of calling each other out, like I'll give an example of, I, I this is Trent Horn recently did a video calling out, it was James Dobson, uh, Jordan Peterson, a couple of Protestant thinkers are, uh, for being very weak on the issue of masturbation and, mm -hmm. and things like that. I actually agreed with pretty much everything he said about masturbation and mm, disagreed good. with all of the Protestant thinkers. Great. And so I think that iron sharpens iron is, mm. is, is a very healthy way to do it, especially when so many of the questions our culture are facing are about what it means to be human, yeah. which I think provides the space to have the sorts of discussions that you very frequently have here on, on the show. There's a great line in the Second Vatican Council that says, when God is forgotten, the human creature becomes unintelligible. It's a great line. It's a great line. I wish I had, uh, I'll show you the <laughs> meme afterwards, but there's actually one of these like hilarious memes of a Protestant saying Catholics are ridiculous. And then uh, uh, um, a Catholic saying Protestants are ridiculous. And there's, you know, like the, the, the woke guy screaming like, um, believe science. And then the two guys saying we have more in common than we previously believed. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, one way that Catholics have been sharpened by our Protestant brethren has been, I would say, kind of theistic apologetics. I, I'm sure Trent Horn would agree that he would, he has learned a great deal from people like Dr. William Lane Craig and others who You've have had helped. him on the show, have you not? Craig? I, yeah. Yeah. Once upon a time, I went down to his, uh, his church, his Baptist church in Atlanta, Georgia, and we had a bit of a discussion. You know, disagree with that guy on certain things, have a great deal of respect for him. It was Dr. Peter Kraft who said, when a maniac is at the door, feuding brothers reconcile. That's in uh, his his book, How to Destroy Western Civilization, I think, right? Okay, I don't yeah. know. It's a very interesting book. It sounds like book. you've read a lot of books on the demise of Western civilization. What was that one you mentioned by, uh, is it Eberstadt? Eberstadt, um, How the West it? Really Lost God. I'm going to have to read that yeah, book. Yeah, she's, her, her most recent book, I think, no, not most recent, her most recent book is uh, Adam and Eve After the Pill Revisited. Mm -hmm. And I will give a shout out to it because anybody who wants to understand the background for a lot of what we're talking about is in that book. And her book, Primal Screams, How the Sexual Revolution Created Identity Politics, also just her best line in that whole book, I think, was um, identity <laughs> politics is the screaming bastard child of the birth control pill. Say that one more time. Identity <laughs> politics is the screaming bastard child of the birth control pill. Uh, I'm going to buy that book immediately. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, another question here. Uh, Matt Hartman says, Jonathan, what would you say to Christian parents who would be against their kids reading Dante, Plato, or other classic literature because they have explicit content? This is coming from a teacher that teaches at a great book school but faces mm. this pushback. Just pick the age. Um, so I, I think there's there's two lines of thinking here, and I'm sure you deal with this as well. Did you ever get a lot of pushback doing presentations on pornography to high schools because there was a contingent of parents who were convinced you were actually introducing the concept to their kids rather than warning them off it? It's a good question. I would, I would say in the beginning I had people um, who would not want to talk specifically about right. pornography. But then something changed and everyone realized we're going to take our head out of the sand, and I got almost no pushback. There were some people... Mm. Uh, usually some ignorant teachers who were under the opinion that their 15-year-old boys and girls hadn't maybe even heard of pornography. That's a possibility because, after all, this is a Catholic school. But thankfully, th those were the minority. And so kudos to them for allowing me to come in. So I got that a lot as well. And I, th I think that the reason parents need to be culturally informed, which does not mean watch all the garbage, but know what's out there, know what most young people are looking at, is to understand where you're going to put the boundaries and when to introduce your children to which things. Right. And so when it comes to when you introduce your children to certain pieces of literature, I actually don't have an opinion. I don't know how young 
somebody could understand? Well, Dante I think anyways, I, I think I've met some like 10 year old boys who should be at my high school presentations. And I've also met some like, I don't know, like a 17 year old homeschool girl who definitely shouldn't be. Like, I, so I, don't it's know. A, it's I find the toughest judgment. grade to be grade seven because the kids either look like they're 36 or they look like they're eight. <laughs> and so, and there's like nothing in between. So like, there's a whole bunch of kids there who yeah. really need the blunt presentation and a yeah. bunch of kids there that are like, people do that. Yeah. And so it's very hard to, dis to discern what's what. Uh, your opinion on smartphones for children. I, well, after, before I ask you that, mm -hmm. let me share you with mine, because a lot of people ask me about this. Uh, we got a gab phone mm -hmm. for our son. He's 15 years old. Yep. He still uses it. It's essentially a smart looking phone. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you can group text, send photos. Uh, it even has like a weather app and a mm -hmm. Bible app. Uh, but that's it. Like yep. you cannot get online. There's actually no way at all that you can do it. And um, but you know what's funny? I would I would I even regret giving him a f uh, that phone at the age of I think he was fourteen and a half or thereabouts when we bought it for him. I regret that because, um, and I won't do it with my other children, even though I gave him a gab phone. Mm. I know there are people watching this thinking, bloody hell, I bought my eight-year-old an iPhone. Right. I forgot to lock it down. But because it really kind of, in a way, took him out of the family unit, mm. even just a little bit. Not by most people's standards, it wouldn't. But to have him be in constant communication, mm -hmm. even just through text yeah. with other people. And I, I don't, I don't, I mean, he's a wonderful boy mm -hmm. and he, he'd be way more disciplined uh, than, than most. But but even that kind of took him out of the family. Yeah. He's now engaging in conversations with friends around the neighborhood mm -hmm. instead of having to be here with mm -hmm. us. So even that I regret, but I certainly think that uh, giving your child a smartphone is, well, let me put it this way. Giving your child a smartphone and not locking it down, I think, is an act of serious neglect and something you need to repent of. So I'll start by saying my kids are five, three, and one, and nothing is more <laughs> irritating than somebody with tons of advice for parents of teenagers because they'll all say, well, wait till, wait yeah. till your kids are older. So I want to say that sure. out of the gate, but I agree with everything you say because one of the... so. This is interesting with regards to the previous discussion we had right before the break in terms of sh cutting off the mainstream culture. So I'll start with smartphones and then work to the to, to other phones is that if you do such a good job, you don't have the streaming services, you're you know, you're you got filters on everything and you're working like crazy to make sure that your kids are actually imbibing your values and participating in your community mm -hmm. rather than being influenced by the mainstream culture, which we have now definitively declared dead. I think that you're basically shooting yourself in the foot. You give them a phone, you're giving them constant access to what the culture is selling. You cannot be on any major social media platform now without yeah. the entire pride agenda being rammed down their throat by, by Google, by Instagram, by TikTok, right? As you know, TikTok is something that the Chinese want for American kids, but won't let their own kids have because it melts their brains. And so you are not going to successfully form the imagination and the moral sensibilities of your child if you give them a smartphone. You're not. It's going to be replaced by persuasion technology that is literally, as Sean Parker, the former CEO of Facebook, put it, it's, it's, it's actually exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology, is how he put it. And so there's a lot of parents who say, I want to teach my kids how to use this responsibly. When you look at a tool and ask yourself, okay, um, how am I going to use this tool? You first have to ask how the designer intended the tool to be used. And when it comes to smartphones and when it comes to social media platforms, these things were literally designed to be addictive. And so when you give your kid a smartphone, you're pitting them against neuroscientists making seven figure salaries to exploit, exploit vulnerabilities in their psychology and keep them scrolling forever. If your kid gets addicted they're using the tool as the designers intended the tool to be used. And so the usual Christian approach of discernment, of using it properly, of keeping it in its right context, mm -hmm. I don't think works when you consider the way the designers intended these things to be used. On your point, too, about communicating with people in the neighborhood, one of the things that I think people need to point out more often is that what these devices do is, for the first time in recorded human history, allow young people to create subterranean social networks that are impervious to adult oversight. And so you just fundamentally don't know what they're doing. They're not part of sort of the embodied community of persons. They're part of this community where adults can have no idea what they're doing, which is why you have these horror stories where like my kid committed suicide because they're being cyberbullied. We never even knew they were getting bullied, mm -hmm. right? So these subterranean networks that do not have adult oversight at the age in their life when they're most prone to make mistakes and most in need of adult wisdom and oversight, I think is just setting us up for failure.
I want to preface what I'm about to say with a preemptive mark, uh, preemptive statement, which is I'm not saying that in order to be a good Christian parent, you have to homeschool. I'm not making uh-huh. that claim. But uh, it sure is a lot easier if you plan on uh, not allowing your children to use smartphones. Whenever I would speak to high school students about pornography, I would request, not just request, but require that I speak to parents. I wouldn't mm. go and speak somewhere unless they would let me right. speak to parents. And uh, the parents always want to know um, how are they going to not allow their kids to have a smartphone by go- going to school. Mm-hmm. And I just couldn't think of anything else to say, but like your child will be a social leper by the time they're eight, nine or ten. That young already? Oh, I think so. And maybe that's okay. Like maybe you're okay with your child having to deal with that, but that's what they're going to have to deal with. And if, it's going to be brutal. If I, can, this, if I can interject, I was okay. in middle school over 10 years ago now, so over a decade ago, and I was one of the last people in my grade to get a phone at 16 over a decade ago now. So it is that young. Yeah, so you've become a social leper, and uh, that's a lot to deal with. Whereas if you homeschool, like you actually don't have that problem. Um, So let me ask you this, because... I'm still kind of trying to work out exactly what I think about how communities can collectively deal with this because it is totally true. A community is supposed to be we have standards we share. Yeah. And then those standards are easy for your family because the family next door has the same standards as you. Is there anything that can be done now that secular authorities are openly testifying as to how this persuasion technology was designed that you have, you know, the news from Silicon Valley that the designers aren't allowing their own kids to have this stuff on and on and on and on. Can we get to a point where like a bulk of parents, like like 30% of parents collectively agree that, you know, we are not going to have these phones? Because I keep on no, maybe I don't naively think so. thinking that no, I don't that should be it. possible. No, no I don't think that's possible because I think that we, the parents, are just as addicted as our children. And we lie to ourselves by saying that, no, it's really not a problem. It doesn't. I, mm. I can put it in its place. Like we're deluding ourselves. Um, it's kind of like the parent who chooses to watch pornography is going to be in a poor position to explain to his child. He won't even be in a position to want to explain to his child. Right Now, obviously, pornography and smartphones yeah, are very different things. I'm not saying but, that phones are intrinsically yeah. evil, but but if I have to justify my own continual use of the phone, I'm going to be much less likely to put impositions on my child from using it, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because as soon as you open that bloody world, mm-hmm. there's, your life gets a lot more complicated. It's like, yeah, it's a good thing to have covenant eyes. It's a good thing to have all uh, Mm -hmm. all these other apps. Like this app will share Mm -hmm. with you Mm -hmm. what text messages are coming through and you'll get this notification from this app if your child did this. And (sighs) Well, there's an interesting book by uh, Frank Mulder. He's a Dutch journalist called Hyper Reality. And he said that's the problem with everything that the phone brings you is it makes the rest of reality kind of an acquired taste. Because what you see on the phone is the yeah. best, most attractive, the sexiest version of everything, right? Right down to if you go to see Victoria Falls, which I have, it looks nothing like the TikTok <laughs> drone footage of Victoria <laughs> Falls, right? Like the experiences you have in real life are never going to be able to match out yeah. with the images being portrayed. And you've got a generation of kids growing up where phones, like what they see on their phone is actually better than real life. Yeah. And they've never had, if they're getting phones at six, seven, eight, then yeah, then they'll never have an opportunity to experience a world that's not mediated by a digital filter. You mentioned earlier that it kind of gives us a distaste for reality. It forms our brains in such a way mm-hmm. that we're unable to engage in other forms of media like literature, I say. And that's true of me. Um, I typically take off August from the internet. I don't think I'll be doing it this year because I was away in Guatemala for like six weeks. Um, but I find that during that time, I'm able to read and I'm able mm. to think. But when I'm in internet land, it's a lot more mm-hmm. difficult. So how have you personally uh, sought to struggle with this? Twitter is my is my crack for sure. <laughs> because I, well, I, I write for a bunch of different publications. Yep. And so I can excuse my Twitter use all the time as something that's necessary for work, regardless of the fact that it constantly invades my life. And I'm very interested in what other commentators and writers who are far like better than me and more skilled than me in their craft. So an event happens and now, I can do three or four scrolls and I can get what like all of the best and most insightful writers in the world are saying about this in real time. And that's been really terrible for me. So I've done deleting all of the apps off the phone. Um, I've done basically, so I don't have the Twitter app on my phone anymore, but I'll still like, especially if I'm traveling at the airport, I used to read for an hour. Now I'll just catch up on the news. And that takes me a whole hour because I have access to everything going on all the time. Part of the problem is like, just like 
we, we talked about the left uh, changing terminology mm. to make things more palatable, like made. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do that uh, regarding the behaviors that we really should be ashamed to engage in. Like, oh, I remember sure. my parents did that. They're like, hey, don't you care about what's going on in the world? Like, uh, that's why you're watching the news. That's not why you're watching the news. Like, this yeah. is your form of entertainment. Mm-hmm. Like, people don't watch or listen to Daily Wire because they want to be informed. Now, that's obviously, that's part of it. Mm. But the reason you find it so addictive is because uh, there's something in you that craves that kind of novelty, perhaps. And I realized that one of the reasons I read so much slower is I read a lot of history because that's my my primary interest. So as you've got a stack beside the bed and a stack nice, beside yeah. my chair. But now with the internet, I'll read about like a minor character in some history. I'm like, oh, very interesting. Ah, yes. And, and then, then like 20, that, 20 exactly minutes later, I know everything about this guy. I've read his whole uh-huh. Wikipedia page and I haven't gotten back to my book and I yeah. didn't chew through like six pages. Well, I'm glad <laughs> to hear that actually because I, I, was, I was afraid you were going to say something like I've never gone away from the dumb phone and, and make me feel deeply no, ashamed about myself. But that would have been cool, by the way, if you had a that but uh, for me personally um i have and i share this because i'd like to encourage other people to do it i was using a particular dumb phone before and then i ended up going to the ukrainian border and needed my iphone and mm-hmm. then i got sucked back into the vortex but i have my wife block the app store okay which is quite easy to do on an apple phone uh so when you go and into settings and you you can block the app store and you do that through let's see screen time There's a way to do that through screen time. And there's a particular password it asks you to enter in order to make these changes. And that password is different from the one that you use to log into your phone. So I pass it to my wife. You set the password. Don't tell me what it is. And then I go and I delete the app store. And then I delete all the apps that access the internet. But which apps suck all of your time? Which ones? Uh, YouTube. But Um. I don't have it. I don't have apps on my right. phone. That's the that's what I'm saying. It's uh, if I did have it, I would just be continually refreshing to see how different videos are doing. Let's say right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's also your job. It's yeah, but it's mm-hmm. uh, but you know what's funny is that you say it's for your job, but it's what kind of like destroys your job because you're no longer interested in engaging in deep conversations and right. reading through things that you could be discussing mm-hmm. with your guest. So that's been that's been really that's been really cool. Yeah. Yeah, so I would recommend people do that. They could mm-hmm. they could either get a dumb phone, block their app store. The other thing that I need to do and that I have been doing is I leave my phone and computer here at night when I go home. Yeah. So uh, I kind of called Thursday as he was picking mm-hmm. up you from the airport, and then I just dropped my phone, dropped the computer, mm-hmm. and I went home. And then I feel like a drug addict, just like feigning for a fix, man. Mm-hmm. I, I want it. Where is it? And Especially if somebody texts me, like, do you see this on the news? And you're like, I didn't. But now I need to know everything that's happening as it's happening. I, I heard of our friend Andrew Jones Thursday. Uh, his father, I hope it's okay to say this. Jacob Imam shared it with me. So I hope it's true. It says he uses his phone to call and text people, but he doesn't answer calls or respond to texts. I thought, what a boss. Because <laughs> the problem with this evil little thing is it makes you feel guilty about not responding. You're always on alert. Yep. It now has that little demonic red or unread message. Mm-hmm message below mm-hmm. your text messages mm-hmm. which by the way you can turn off in settings mm. but to me that is the most difficult thing about putting my phone away is i'm afraid that people think i'm ignoring them yeah, yeah, yeah. of course i come to the conclusion that it's okay to ignore them yeah. you know they have no right on your time right. your family does mm-hmm. so 100% good well there's my little rant on phones yep. i people agree with love everything it. you said people love it uh any interesting uh, chatter we had one um i sent it to you in slack but i oh, could just thank you uh, um, ask it, but because it's yeah, short. Feel, yeah, feel free to ask um, it. Yeah. So it was a it was a young man. I'll leave his name out because the topic. But he thanks. Yeah. Um. Uh, here basically, it is. the gist from the question seemed that he's an older, a, uh, a younger man, a young man who's older. Can I read um, it? Yeah. Yeah. Let me read it because I think it, it's an important question. I think there's we get some good answers, good good thoughts on this too. Um. Older brother in the chat asking if he should address porn with his middle school brother because he thinks his parents will not, and if so, how to do it. I have an answer. You go first. All right. So I am a big fan of the excellent children's book. It's called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures by Kristen Jensen, Porn Proofing Today's Young Kids. And it's a beautifully illustrated book designed for parents to read to their children about pornography in a way that is age appropriate. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there would be anything wrong uh, let's say with an older brother explaining to their younger brother in this way. 
And so the way this is done is, and I did this with my eight-year-old, I've talked to all of my children about pornography, is I'll say to, say, a seven-year-old or six-year-old, I think six is a great time, by the way, for parents to talk to their children about pornography. You say, pornography is pictures or videos of people showing parts of their body that their bathing suit should cover. Mm -hmm. And if you ever see this, mm -hmm. you should always tell mommy and daddy, we'd be really proud of you, we wouldn't be in trouble. Mm -hmm. Um that is not a complete or even sufficient definition of pornography, mm -hmm. but it's sufficient mm -hmm. for an eight-year-old. Yep. Um, so that's what I would say. What would you say? Go to Defend Young Minds to yeah. get the book. They've got all sorts of... Why is it the Mormons who make all the best resources The Mormons are the best. We just talked but about Gab Phone. I'm pretty sure they're behind I, that. Probably. Yeah, yeah, the Light Phone. Was that, was that them too, I think? The Light Phone was not. Uh, no, that's, okay. that's like, I think, like a Manhattan secular company. Okay. You might be thinking of the Wise Phone. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not made by Mormons either. Yeah. So <laughs> Defend Young Minds has a whole com. bunch of resources and it helps walk people through it. I'd be interested in your thoughts on this because I don't actually have a problem with like an older brother if they want to check with their younger brother on yeah. how things are doing, just because at the end of the day, if you've got brothers and sisters who are close to each other, they're going to feel more comfortable actually mm. going yeah. to the older sibling. And that's, that's who they're going to get their questions actually, from. Yeah, yeah. Because like for me, so I was the oldest, right? And my, uh, my younger brother probably asked me most of the questions he had about the stuff uh. and, and not, and not my parents. And my, my dad joked before too. He's like, yeah, I, I know I have to make sure you get all this information because it's likely where your brother's going to get it from after that. I'm deeply ashamed by what I share with my younger brother. God have mercy on me, a sinner. Yeah. So if you got somebody saying, I'm worried that my, uh, my younger brother might struggle with porn, he might actually, if he is admit it to his older brother way faster than he'll admit it to his dad. And so anybody who wants to check with their friends or their family members on whether or not they look at porn for the purpose of encouraging them to get free yeah. should do it. Yeah. Because unfortunately, some people don't have parents who are receptive to the con uh, conversation. Some will have parents who will be stunned and shocked and yell. Um, and some have parents who just don't want to deal with it yeah. because they they don't know how to talk about it. And so they're like, they do, you know, the talk. That like one thing at 20 minutes yeah. long when you're 17 where everybody wishes they were dead and then they never discuss it again. Yeah. And so if you're the kind of person who recognizes that this is a problem or has been a problem for you and you want to talk to younger people about it, please do. Yeah. And I would just say, be careful that you don't share too much. It's scandalizing the youth really is a, is a serious sin. Our Lord mm -hmm. said that if you cause one of these little mm -hmm. ones to stumble, it would be better that a millstone was tied around your neck and you were thrown mm -hmm. into the sea. And uh, as Peter Kraft once quipped, I do not believe he has begun manufacturing styrofoam, styrofoam millstones. So mm -hmm. it is a serious thing. We don't want to uh, pique our children or our younger siblings' curiosity, let's say, or pervert their imagination by describing sexual acts to them. Mm. But saying, showing parts of your body that your bathing suit should cover is not that. And you might follow up with saying that it's precisely because the body is good that we veil what demands the reverence. You know, it has to do with the body's goodness. If the body were meaningless, then we couldn't degrade it. You can't degrade what's meaningless because what's meaningless has no grade to begin with. We don't talk about degrading paper clips and washing machines. We talk about degrading men because we believe that men have inherent dignity. Um, and so... It's been said that the problem with porn isn't that it shows too much, but that it shows too little in a way because it reduces the mystery of femininity, right? The, the, mm. the, the mystery of the human being to a two-dimensional object for my consumption. And um, So here's a question for please. you. Please. Um, so when I'm talking to somebody who has been, as I said, that they're, uh, they're hooked on porn, I never proactively offer information. I ask them questions. I ask I, them what yeah. they've seen, what I they've been looking good, at. Yeah. And so... I think a lot of the viewers might find this helpful too. And I'd like to hear your answer to this question because I get asked it all the time and I'm not completely sure is if you got a kid. So I talked to a, a kid recently who was 15. Mm -hmm. um, I asked him how long he'd been hooked on porn. He said uh, for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So since he was five back in the day, you would tell people get like pick an accountability partner, somebody who will actually hold you accountable, somebody uh, who does not struggle themselves so that you're not, you know, messing up together and, yep. and, 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 and essentially forming a, a codependent relationship. What do you do now when you've got a five-year-old who's been addicted for 10 years, who basically had was robbed of his childhood by the pornography industry, was not actually able to form a lot of healthy re reactions and responses to things because his brain was being reshaped? How does somebody like that get free? Like I got a, a message from parents a little while ago saying like, 
That 13 year old been addicted for a few years mm. and they couldn't even allow them around technology anymore. Yeah. But they were like, okay, so the filter doesn't work. You know, even radical amputation doesn't necessarily work because of the way the brain functions. So therapy is what I've usually recommended. What, what, what do you recommend when you get a case of a, of a kid whose mind has been shaped by this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I think I'd agree with you. Finding a certified sex addiction therapist mm. in your area, CSAT for short, you can, there's many different websites where you can punch in a postal code uh, to find a therapist, mm. a, a certified sex addiction therapist. Now you might think, well, uh, what if I don't trust him or her? Mm. What if I don't know what it is they think is acceptable or not? Interview them, yeah. ask them questions. Yeah. Uh, if you yourself want to go see a therapist, you might stipulate the terms of your sobriety. You might say, I'm opposed to, and whatever, mm -hmm. contracepted sex. Mm -hmm. Uh, quote unquote sex with self, otherwise known as self abuse. Uh, can you work with me mm -hmm. within these guidelines? Mm -hmm. And a therapist will hopefully say, of course. And most of them are just oriented towards reduction of the behavior you want to reduce. So most of them would be yeah, fine I would with say your parameters. So. I mean, I'd be afraid that you would find uh, somebody to say, well, in order to avoid pornography, uh, just masturbate or something right, like yeah, that. Yeah. And see, this is this was my Use other- Use the hard drive of existing porn in your head. Exactly. This, this was my other kind of problem with what was shared on that Daily Wire clip. The idea being that if, you know, pornography can be used to avoid adultery, then it's okay. I've already pointed out less bad doesn't mean healthy. But the, the idea that pornography quells and doesn't inflame sexual desire is false. You know, this so is, it irritates very, it. It's, sorry. Yeah. You know, have you read Ross Duthit's book, mm -hmm. uh, The Decadent Society? No. Do you know who Ross Duthit I've is? I've heard right? of the so, book, but I, ha I don't know anything about so him. So he's, uh, he's the, the, the resident Catholic um, editorialist and, and opinion columnist for the New York Times. Wow. I should he, get to know him. He is a you know what? He'd be he'd he'd be a fascinating interview. He's he's an incredibly intelligent, a fantastic writer, um, very very unapologetic on issues that the New York Times usually is apologetic on. Things wow. like abortion. His column on the Eighth Amendment in Ireland was oh, they just allow him uh, to to write there. That's it's kind of bewildering to yeah. me often because he's even late. He did he wrote a long essay last <laughs> year on on the contours of the LGBT culture war and language. I'm stunned they let him use. Uh -huh. But in his book, when he's talking about the decadent society, he kind of tries to make the case that it's not a radical decline. It's that everything's stagnating rather than declining. And the section he has in his book on pornography, I think, is the biggest mistake that he made where he basically says, look, um, in fact, pornography is reducing the rates of sexual assault. My argument would be, no, it's now actually mainstreaming them. So you have sexual violence is more popular than it's ever been. It's just now called a Fifty Shades of Grey relationship or consensual. And so yeah. things that used to be illegal are being moved into the legality category mm -hmm. and being accorded, um, you know, the Wanted solemnity. sexual violence, for ex the it, example you gave. Exactly. Um, but he actually he actually doesn't seem to totally understand what, what you're getting at, which is that pornography actually ruins you for a healthy sexual relationship in some ways. He would 100% say it's a sin. He would say it's, a, you know, a gravy all those things but the the social and cultural impact of pornography and the extent to which it's transforming boys at the key ages of their development i don't think yeah. it's properly understood i really hope you get a debate prager because i think you could probably he's a very reasonable guy i, I bet I you could like bring him, him around deal. Yeah. yeah yeah i mean even if it were the case that pornography prevented rape i would still say pornography is evil you know what else would prevent rape is castration um there yeah. are certain things that are intrinsically disordered and wrong that ought not to be engaged in regardless but no, I, I agree with you that, uh, and besides, what kind of love do we have for a person if we say, well, stick with your violent sexual pornography so you don't commit sexual violent acts on real people? Mm -hmm. uh, wh what? Wouldn't we want that person healed? Why would we be okay with them? That would be like saying to somebody, well, it's good that we have sort of uh, even animated pedophilia yeah. Yeah. to prevent people from doing No, wouldn't you? Shouldn't we be healing these people? So there's that, and we yeah, there was actually like a generally very good columnist for the National Post in Canada named Barbara Kay, who kind of wrote a column on this new phenomenon of like child sex dolls for pedof pedophiles, yeah. and basically made the argument that this is better than them taking out their abuse on real children. But if pornography has taught us everything, <laughs> is not that it satiates desire. That's like giving somebody a big glass of salt water and telling them it, it, it'll quell their thirst. Yeah. What you're actually doing is you're entrenching that feeling, you're developing it further, and you're making them desire. You're normalizing it. Yeah. So if you give a pedophile one of these dolls, all you're doing is ensuring that he's accessing those desires, he's cultivating those desires, and he wants to act on them even more. But the relationship between porn and behavior is not understood very well, in my view. Mm. Yeah. 
Yep. Well, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, F.C. Baggett from Locals asks, Jonathan, I love your opinion. Thursday like that. Sorry, F.C. Baggett. I actually happen to respect your last name. I think that's a bit, Matt. I think he's just getting you to say. No, I don't think so. F.C. Baggett. It's not F.C. Agate. It's F.C. Baggett. All right. We'd like to apologize. (laughs) And we'd also like to thank you for not trusting us with your first name. (laughs) Jonathan, I love your opinion, and it really seems to ring true that secularism comes from the sexual revolution. However, where would you say the sexual revolution comes from? So I will emphasize that this is is not my opinion, Um, not because I'm passing the buck, but because I'm giving credit. This is Mary Aberstadt's theory in her book, uh, How the West Really Lost God. Um, Very. uh, What is secularism? Secularism, like so, it really depends on who you ask. Um, Charles Taylor in a secular age basically uh, talks about a the the Christian society was a society in which which had what he called bulwarks of belief, and what he, how he defined bulwarks of belief were beliefs that took a great effort not to believe in. The the path of least resistance was to believe in these things. Now our society has bulwarks of unbelief, which Douglas Murray is referring to when he talks about scriptural criticism, when he talks about, you know, the debunking of miracles, when he talks about Darwinian evolution and the origin Mm -hmm. of humanity. And so now in order for somebody to to become a Christian, there's these bulwarks of unbelief Mm. they must overcome. So I would, for the purposes of of, of most discussions on this, define secularism as a culture in which bulwarks of unbelief belief have replaced bulwarks of belief that's very good which i think is a helpful way to to kind of yeah. bifurcate um we're in this sort of post pregnant widow moment where christendom is dead and we don't know what's going to come next yet <laughs> so we're sort of in this in-between moment that we're all trying to figure out together um but w- what mary aberstadt said i interviewed her and i asked her the same question is the sexual revolution was a rebellion against a whole bunch of things and not all of them were bad. So you also had with the hippie movement sort of this rejection of materialism. If you if you listen to a lot of the things that they were rebelling against, it sounds very much like, like a traditionalist's suspicion of free market vulture capitalism or something like that. But I asked her, I said, I understand that a, young, a youth generation rebelled. I would actually pinpoint the rebellion of the intellectual classes, which then spread throughout the rest of society at places like Berkeley and in Paris at the 68 riots with what Kinsey did to undermine faith in the greatest generation. And so when you have Alfred Kinsey, who releases his Kinsey reports in 48 and 53, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I assume most of your viewers yep. are, are, are we familiar We just had a big them. discussion of this with Jason Everett Perfect. last week. So one of the unremarked on aspects of what Alfred Kinsey actually did is he releases these books and basically makes the case that over 90% of Americans are, by the standards of the law at that period, sex criminals. Mm-hmm. Now, what do you think that would do to the confidence of a young generation of people brought up in the church, brought up with a set of moral values who are then told your grandfather was lying to you, your mother was lying to you, most of your dads used prostitutes, you... none of them yes. waited until marriage. Apparently, if you were on a farm, you were very likely getting it on with with, with the livestock. Mm-hmm. These are all things that were in these reports and they were accepted as true even by conservatives who now recognize that they were lies. So, you had William F. Buckley, you know, the sort of pred- dominant media Catholic of the day, genius guy, um, in his discussions about the Kinsey reports on the show in the 50s and 60s, saying things like, we know that this is true, but Catholic Oof. doctrine still holds. And so for me, I've always thought that one of the answers to why so many young people rebelled is because a culture collectively bought the lie. That they cannot that they, trust their superiors. That they, all of their, their don't trust anybody over 30. Why? Because the Kinsey reports told us what they were getting up to in between the sheets. And then they were being told, you, you need to behave this way, but nobody else had. So what the Kinsey reports did was damn the previous generations as abject hypocrites, that they were uh, expecting a standard f- from young people that they themselves were not living by. By. And as such, it was very easy to reject that standard because Kinsey had created this myth of the greatest generation that was, in fact, deeply perverted in many, many ways. And so add to that, you know, the Vietnam War, add to that these consistent um, things like the Watergate scandal, which were were creating even more widespread distrust in in uh, in institutions. And you kind of you get a generation of people who feel lied to by their parents, by their grandparents, by their government. You have working class people being sent off to fight in a war in Indochina that most of them do not, in fact, believe in. And you get a generation of people who basically says, we can't trust any of you and we are going to live the way we want to. We're going to we're going to enjoy free love. And then the question I asked Mary Aberstadt is, 
if you look at the polling data, which David David Frum, who's gone off the rails now, but he's got a great book called How We Got Here on the 70s, and he tracks the data on young people abandoning the sexual ethics of their parents, mainly because, in my view, they didn't believe their parents actually practiced those sexual ethics. But then that generation later in the 80s, which is ironically the decade of the great conservative backlash mm -hmm. to the sexual revolution, you have parents who got married, didn't leave their spouses, lived those traditional sexual ethics, which just got on board. And so I, I, I said to Mary Aberstadt, I'm like, what I don't under, I understand why the youth abandoned those values. I understand why the sexual revolution happened. What I don't understand is why there wasn't more pushback from the parents. And she said, cowardice is the most powerful force in human history. And sometimes the answer is very simple. And most of them simply did not push back. Um, they, they did not discipline their kids. They did not fight against the lies that were told them about Kinsey, which were accepted by not only the elite institutions, but it sold 100,000 copies in like the first month, I think. So this was an objective bestseller by like regular standards. And it's a boring, uh, you've probably seen it before, mm -hmm. right? It's a boring, dry book full of tables. And hundreds of thousands of people were buying it. So that's, in my view, why the young people adopted the sexual revolution. And Mary Aberstadt's answer to why the parents didn't push back is cowardice. Yeah, cowardice uh, being shamed into it, because if you were to question Kinsey or Playboy, mm -hmm. you were uncouth, you were yep. unsophisticated, yep. backwater. Hugh yeah. Hefner was also on like William F. Buckley's firing line in a suit puffing on his pipe, and God, he mess. wasn't respectable, but he was given respectability. Yeah. Like this idea that the Playboy philosophy was anything more than sort of the carnivorous desires of elite men. Who did did you did you hear about that uh, documentary series Secrets of Playboy that came out last no, year? Tell me about it. It's on A and E, and basically all these women who were abused by Hefner are now coming forward and yeah. telling stories that are better left undescribed, not right. only on YouTube but anywhere. Yep. But one of the lines that really st stuck out to me because I think that for me it's it's a microcosm of what the sexual revolution did is he's uh, one of the the women who worked for Hefner said Hefner and his pals like to bring in sort of naive. Girls from small towns, the all-American beauty, and then watch the light go out in their eyes. Mm -hmm. That it was, what they were doing was was deliberately facilitating corruption and destruction. And uh, Hugh Hefner was unfortunately one of the most significant historical figures of the past century, and we're all living in his country now. Yeah, God have mercy. Um, Ryan says... Uh, how ought young people in a university setting attack the various issues of obscenity for peers around them? Do you think it is even possible at most secular universities to mount a real opposition? Thank you. Love the episode. Huh. That's tough because I went to university. I graduated with my degree in 2010 and I went to one of the most left-wing universities in Canada and I had a blast because I debated my professors. I ran the pro-life club. That's where I, I met. I pity your professors. <laughs> That's where I met Stephanie Gray, actually. Mm, and Stephanie Gray asked me to abandon my my, my plans of academia and instead um, invited me to join the organization I work for now. So she kind of set my career path into the pro-life movement. Bless her. Love that woman. Um, and... It, things were so different, like transgenderism was a joke when I was in school among the progressives. And that is like, again, we're talking like 2010, right? Mm -hmm. So what I would say right now is that go to university, attempt, I saw, I'm a huge fan of pro-life clubs. If you're going to, if you were going to mount any kind of opposition, reaching out to women on campus who think they only have one option is the one thing that you can do to love your neighbor and to actually save real lives. You can make your degree uh, count for human beings that will actually like live out their lives, get married, have families, just because you decide to put a pro-life table next to the Planned Parenthood table. They are on every campus. And so if, you, if you're going to pick one issue to speak out on, that is the one I would so encourage you to speak out on because I have, I could tell you so many stories of women who canceled their abortions just because we set up a, a display. And like there's children who are alive right now simply because some university students proposed an alternative to the abortion industry, which is on every campus. The difficulty with knowing what you're going to do with your professors is the radicalization that's happened. So I know this is true on Canadian campuses now. Um, you're usually asked to declare your pronouns in most classes. So you're asked to sort of participate in this mm -hmm. broader lie that's destroying our civilization. I don't think uh, that Christians can in good conscience participate in offering their pronouns because I think that it is... Uh, submitting to and yeah. confirming premises of an ideology that are fundamentally anti-Christian and wicked. At the same time, I understand that students are in a tough position if they want to just finish their degree and get out. I know students were almost done their degree. Now this comes in. Are they going to blow up their whole education over it? 
All I would say is I would encourage people to prayerfully consider what their stand would be. I wouldn't give direct advice because it would seem too cute and too easy for me to do, mm. to ask them to blow up their whole education over sure. what may appear to them to be a minor issue. Yeah. I'm always calling this into the fact when I have these discussions that like my job is to understand these issues, write about these issues, to do activism. And so to expect the same standard of engagement from somebody who just wants to get their schooling done so they can yeah. get married and have a family is probably not fair. Yeah, yeah. Well, I also think we have other options too. I mean, there are good universities like Franciscan University of Steubenville where the peer pressure is to become a saint. Where was that again? Steubenville? Steubenville. Steubenville. Yeah. You've heard of it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like uh, in most college campuses, it's uh, the peer pressure is to, what, a, mm -hmm. what about it? Be a degenerate or uh, yep. to party. Here, you can do that if you want. I'm sure mm -hmm. there's ways of doing that. And there are people who would, who would encourage it even among the student body. But those that I speak to and invite them to be really honest with me say that's difficult to do. Mm. So Franciscan isn't the only place to do yeah. that. Um, it's which which direction is the peer pressure pushing you in? Here? I think. Yeah, yeah that's no, the question. Like, be, yeah. Between the two different universities. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's it's, a great question. It's fun to be subversive, too. This is like the new punk rock is to... Well, this is what I kind of tell everybody. I wrote an article for the European Conservative called How to Be a Counter-Revolutionary. And I said, for all you people who've wanted to rebel your whole lives, like, now is your time. Mm. And you get to rebel... In defense of everything that's good, you get to rebel in defense of goodness and truth and beauty and marriage and family and the great works of literature. Like who would have ever thought we have enemies that are so stupid they would abandon the great works of the classics and the composers to us? Like this is what they've left us to defend. Uh, like what, like it's, 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 it almost boggles the mind when you consider the sorts of things they're throwing out and we can now pick out of the trash can. And I also, uh, you know, I get, I've gotten to travel like quite a bit and meet pro-life organizations around the world, pro-life leaders in every country where the sexual revolution has taken root. There's been a backlash to that sexual revolution. Yeah. And so I always say I get to visit a country and, and visit the very best people that are there. And like, what, what a group of warriors we get to do battle with when it comes to being a counter-revolutionary, right? So, mm. so, you know, the, the long answer, um, for subcultures is, you know, settle down, you know, start a family. This is going to take a while. Yeah. But being a counter-revolutionary gives us all of, all of this sort of the, the, the joy of the combat that they wanted in the sixties, but we're on the right side. Yeah. I love it. Let me give you an argument against swearing, which I think is compelling, but it's one that I don't want to believe. Okay. Because I enjoy swearing. How would you define swearing? As I okay, so I would like to distinguish between blasphemy, yes. vulgarity, perhaps, yes. uh, swearing, I suppose, uh, you know, potty language or the F word, things like mm -hmm. that, when they aren't used in a sexualized way. Right. But I think even that needs to go. And I'm saying mm -hmm. this as somebody who swears mm -hmm. more than everybody listening to me right now. Okay. But I'm trying very hard not okay. to. And I know that outing myself in this way mm -hmm. is uh, only going to come back to bite me when I swear on the next episode or in the next mm -hmm. five minutes. And uh, But I welcome it. It's something in my life that I'd like to get rid of. Right. Right. So here's the argument, and you tell me what you think. All right. So I think that most swearing, and I've shared this on the show mm -hmm. before, so apologies if you've heard it or if those watching are bored by it. I've heard you do it once. All Let's right. hear it again. And you feel free to interject mm -hmm. and interrupt and pick at it or mm -hmm. make it better because I actually like to mm -hmm. keep swearing. So you can help me keep swearing if you can take Unlikely. this apart. Mm -hmm. So I think that most of our swear words revolve around three things, the bedroom, the toilet, or religion. That's fair. Yep. <laughs> We're all good. We've all got a roller deck yeah. of <laughs> awful words <laughs> filing through our brains right now. There might be some that aren't that way. Okay. These seem to be the places that human beings are most vulnerable, which I find interesting. Right. Religion, the bedroom, and the bathroom. Okay. Let's just put aside religion. Okay. Since I think we should agree that agree on blasphemy that. is intrinsically yes. evil. So let's talk about you know, the bedroom and the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you examine human beings, you see that they institute rituals of a sort that uh, elevate these experiences that we share with the beasts. Uh, so beasts copulate and defecate. Mm. Okay. Uh, we're not like that. We're rational mm -hmm. uh, animals. And so w the way we do those things, when you examine human beings, uh, differs. If you came over to my house after this and I allowed my 10 year old to defecate in the backyard while you and I were there, uh, this isn't good. This isn't healthy. You would have serious <laughs> questions about my mental well-being yeah. or what I'm like. 
if you encounter someone fornicating in the middle of the street or at a club, mm -hmm. this also is something that's devious, uh, deviant and uh, reprehensible. So rather, we go into rooms, we shut doors, mm -hmm. we even put the fan on so that we can urinate without being heard next door where the kitchen is, mm -hmm. okay? All right. When we swear, mm -hmm. we're verbally tearing down those barriers that we seek to erect around those activities to elevate us from the beast. Right. That's the basic idea, okay. that we're, we're verbally tearing away at that mm -hmm. and someone might say okay fair enough but when i say s-h-i-t mm -hmm. or f-u etc when i say these words i'm not actually using them in a sexual way but i think the response to that is and yet they still mean the things that you know them to mean mm -hmm. maybe in a thousand years the f word won't mean that anymore and right. no, like just the word like the word gay doesn't really mm -hmm. mean happy today okay and at that point we could perhaps we could perhaps use that word but today is not that day it still means that and um, when you couple with that, James is St. James's advice mm -hmm. in the Bible about guarding the tongue. Mm -hmm. uh, again, why why would I f flirt with something that I'm even unsure is moral or immoral? Why wouldn't I seek to be pure in my speech? All right. So let me just I'll put mm -hmm. that to one side and then say, I think what I enjoy about swearing and what I enjoy... Like if you and I were to get in a conversation, mm. you would just start like letting it fly. Mm. Like I'd enjoy it. I like it. Mm -hmm. And I think I like it because it signals to me that you are not on guard. That right. you're actually you're actually being candid. Yeah. yeah, yeah you're being yeah, very yeah. candid. And I really appreciate that. Yeah. So I actually like it when people swear around me. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, maybe I shouldn't, but I do. Mm -hmm. And yet I still think that argument holds. What's wrong with it? Why should we swear, no, Jonathan? I, I actually, so so I, I would make a couple of distinctions. Um, I agree with pretty much everything that you said. Oh, on the F word, the only question I would have is, so you, you, did you read Gil Dine's book, Pornland? Uh, unfortunately, I read excerpts of it. Yeah, same. And then uh, <laughs> Louise Perry has a book that came out last year. And I year. only say unfortunately because there were some things there that I didn't want to know. I, I, uh, I, I and I would it. not recommend the book. Uh, no, I read it so that other people wouldn't have to read it. Yeah. But I only got a little ways into some chapters. I don't need to go all the way down to the sewer to know that it's the same stuff down there. Yeah. Um, but they, uh, and Louise Perry in her book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, both of them use the F word as an actual literal descriptive term I see. of what a certain form of sexual activity is. Okay. That it's, because it's crude and degraded and predatory, that the F word is the best word to describe what's going on. I see. As opposed to, to sex. So I would agree mm. with you using it in, in, in casual and colloquial terms. Yeah, 100%. I can't come up with it. I can't and I wouldn't come up with any good argument against it because it does seem also to be, you know, um, be, it's being crude about one of God's gifts. But then from when I read it in, in those two books, they weren't using it as an yeah. expletive or a swear word. Like it was literally used as a, I could quote a sentence, but I won't. Yeah. <laughs> but like, I remember getting through to the end of one of Louise Perry's chapters and then her describing something that often happened after nightclubs. Yep. And like when the word used, it punched. Yep. It was like, like, no, no, I get and that. And it was used in context, yep. so, but I didn't feel like that was offensive. And if one of my mm -hmm. kids as a teenager wanted to read that book to educate themselves, I wouldn't feel like the need to warn them or black it out. Like I felt it worked there. Yeah, I think usually um, you keep going. Um, honestly, I've never considered shit to be a swear word. Right. Um, and like I, I grew up in, in farm country where like it would be said like, oh, no, we're going to go out and spread shit now. Yeah. Like it was like it was literally used and as I grew that up term. in Australia. My, my wife, yeah. when we were dating, visited Australia, she said to me after one conversation with my dear, beautiful mother, Debbie, who I love, <laughs> I have not heard this many swear words ever. Like yeah, I, I had to ac I accidentally taught my wife some swear words that she had never heard. I before. found the Irish were like that, too. And I was yeah. on, on speaking to yeah. her there. So I recognize that there's plenty of people who find that word to be a swear word. And I like uh, as somebody once told me it's like it's not that i think it's bad i just think it makes you sound uneducated mm. um and so i just i i, I like if i find out it bothers somebody i will de i will definitely avoid it yeah. um but i don't feel bad about saying it my wife and i were away on a trip recently and she encountered somebody and said oh the restaurant's over there or something and the woman just like dropped sh just mm. as if it was like <laughs> like that it just just came out like it was normal and like she, exactly like that and my wife yeah <laughs> and um i think she was from <laughs> quebec was and um, <laughs> an amazing noise. <laughs> I think my wife, my wife is like, why would you assume that you can just meet me and say mm -hmm. this word? I think mm -hmm. it does. It is illustrative of the baseness of our culture mm -hmm. that we've begun to speak like this 
just among people that we've never met before. And around ladies. And there's a lot yeah. of standards that should have stayed out. But you notice that when you're talking with guys, guys will often kind of feel each other out to find out which words they not can up. use. They'd feel each other, not up. I said out. Yeah, you did. Yes. I just want to make sure yeah. that people heard you. <laughs> Everybody yeah. heard that properly. Get the way, guys, <laughs> get together. <laughs> but no you know, like they'll kind of see how the other person talks and stuff yeah. like that to make sure that, you yeah. know, nothing they say will be offensive. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not, a, to, yeah. to reiterate, I'm not offended by it. I like it very much. Yeah. I just think that this is I think your argument something is very in my s- life. Stable. Yeah. I would like, and this is not, this doesn't originate by me. I should point out this was a friend of mine shared this with me several years ago. But I just, uh, I, I'd like to get better at it. I'd like to. I, I, this is an area in my life I'd like to get better at. So it's like to be able to point at the culture and say, "Look how decadent it's becoming." While I drop f bombs and mm-hmm. and s words, it's like I. Yeah. I thought the blasphemy has gotten a lot more common in Christian communities too. And I think it's because mm. of the entertainment, like, oh my gee, like, as you hear it a yeah. lot more often, like if I ever said that at home growing up, I would have, yeah. I would have gotten beat. <laughs> well, I like your point earlier yeah. about when you heard Peterson saying mm. that word, it, 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 it it's like, it, it's difficult sometimes to discern whether or not something's blasphemous or a prayer, because sometimes you hear something yeah. so horrific that you just go, oh God. Yeah. yeah the example I always, yeah. always think is when I first watched the footage of the, like the nine 11, like when people were jumping and you'd hear people saying, yeah. oh my like it didn't seem like a swear, yeah. but I'm so as the way I was brought up, I'm just very instinctively uncomfortable with any mm-hmm. improper usage of it at all. Like it's a name. It's why the that's why like Jewish people have a dash between the G and the D. So you pause and you think it's right beautiful. about the holy name. So yeah, that I think also is is sort of the one we everybody can agree on. <sighs> Got more questions coming in. No, but this has oh. just been so fantastic. Yeah, this has been amazing. Yeah. I'm like jealous that you're 36? 34. 34. I, I'm, I'm so grateful for you. I mean, you've said, you've, you've, I, I've read, I read your articles. I think, how is this fella in his 30s? You've, you've got a lot of wisdom. Thank you. So who are you working for right now? Like who, who's your, do you have an employer or do you just, are you like a freelance uh, writer or? I'll let you light that cigar, and then we could talk about the morality of cigars, I suppose, at some point. But. Please, let's not. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, no, I still work full-time for the Canadian Centre for Bioethical Reform, which is the pro-life organization Stephanie Gray founded. And uh, we have, we hold internships where we, we confront millions of Canadians every year with the truth about abortion. Uh, this year, we'll hopefully have over 50 people on the team across the country. So it's an, the pro-life movement is still is still my first passion and always will be. Um because it's you when you when you're out in the streets and you're having discussions with people, like you see such obvious results: people changing their minds, people canceling their abortions, mm-hmm. and so that's my that's my main my main job. And then I I'm a contributing editor to the European Conservative, which is a journal based out of uh, Brussels and Vienna, and I got to do a lot of the longer essays on stuff like this. Um, the pro life movement's actually what got me thinking about all of this because it was when I first started going out in the streets and on mm-hmm. campuses and having discussions about abortion. I just realized this very much looked like the way Trump talks, <laughs> and I didn't. I don't like it at all. So I'll stop. Frankly, okay. um, the best <laughs> <laughs> is I because I grew up in a I grew up in a, an amazing family mm-hmm. in which I had a mom and a dad. I never doubted that people that people loved me. I had grandparents again. I had you know dozens and dozens and dozens of cousins. Mm-hmm. And so going off to university and starting to do activism and realizing how broken the culture was was a real eye opener. And that's what started me off on the path of kind of doing all this research and trying to figure out like when did things fall apart. Like I realized I'd kind of lived in a subculture while the rest of Christendom was dying around me. I was living in this sort of patch of green where I could still grow up the way my parents had grown up to a large extent yeah. to grow up without TV, without movies, just reading the same books my dad read when he was a kid. Um, but then realizing how broken the rest of the culture was. And with my background in history, I started doing that research. So now I get to write for a, a whole bunch of places and I, and I really enjoy doing it. I get to uh, write for first things and the European conservative and like, I don't know, That's wonderful. seven, seven or eight other places. Have you written books yet? Yeah, a few. Yeah. Um, in 2016, I wrote the culture war and it was almost immediately, oh, that's right. yes. it was almost immediately outdated. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, my favorite one that I got to, I got to write was, uh, um, Patriots, the untold story of Ireland's pro-life movement, which is the story of how the Irish kept abortion out of Ireland for 35 I, years. I bet the Catholic, the Irish Catholics love you for that. Oh yeah. I got to do a book tour in Ireland, uh, last fall, finally after, uh, after COVID. And it's, it's such a, oh, it's such an unbelievable story. And one of the things I'm very passionate about with my writing is you see the sexual revolution and being because the sexual revolutionaries own the social imaginary, mm-hmm. our heroes who fought to stem the tide, who fought for preborn babies, who fought to hold these things back, are only ever portrayed as villains. Yeah. And so in our own culture, Kinsey gets a blockbuster right. movie with Liam, Liam Neeson, Neeson and 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 Milk 
what's his face? Harvey Milk, mm-hmm. right? He gets a blockbuster movie, Statutory Rapist, um, with Sean, starring Sean Penn. And then Phyllis Schlafly, who's the great Catholic activist who almost single-handedly stopped the Equal Rights Amendment and kept abortion from being enshrined. Um, she gets Mrs. America, where she's portrayed as this cold, evil witch with mm-hmm. a, you know, a miserable marriage. And so a couple of the, the, a lot of the articles that I write and some of the books that I, I have written and I'm working on are to tell our side of the story. Because right now, our subcultures don't have the stories of the counter-revolutionaries, of the Phyllis Schlafly's, Ted Byfield in Canada, Mary Whitehouse in the UK, the pro-life movement in Ireland, who saved, at a minimum, 250,000 babies in managing to keep the Eighth Amendment in place for 35 years. Right? You can look at it as the story as all the abortion activists finally won, or you can look at the story of ordinary men and women with big families put boots on the ground every day in a country where abortion was already legal just because they cared about children not their own and saved a quarter of a million of them mm-hmm. right like that's that's our story these are our heroes these are the people that we should be looking to for inspiration and an example and so that's what i said in my book yeah. tour in ireland if you want the inspiration and the encouragement to go on the answer is look at what you've already done Oof. look at the past 35 years yeah. if we can see light at the end of the tunnel it's because we stand on the shoulders of giants like them i'm not sure if you're aware of this or not but my friend father jason sharon is a ukrainian catholic priest is going to be building a shrine to celebrate the overturning of Roe versus Wade here in Pittsburgh. And uh, it's going to be the biggest... Uh in Pittsburgh, is it an hour away? Uh, yeah, about yeah. that. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So it's uh, it's going to be great. And one of the things he wants to do is to actually enshrine pro life heroes in a kind of museum section of the place. So to, who, to who would he them. pick? Out of curiosity, well, I actually am not sure. Right. But he called me um, just. I think it was right after Roe versus Wade was overturned, or maybe I think it was even mm-hmm. before when when we kind of got wind of it. Yeah, but yeah, we yeah. weren't we weren't sure if it was going to happen. The leaks, the leaks. And ruling? he said to me like, "How many, you know, ha- uh, rosaries have been offered?" Uh, you know, for the overturning of this, how many mm. beautiful old women stood out in front of mm-hmm. these abortion mills and prayed for this to happen? Mm-hmm. And now that it's happened, what are we going to do to thank our blessed mother? Yeah. I don't know what, what that sounds like as a Protestant hearing me say something like well, that. But the point is, we're going to build the. Yeah. yeah. So, do you, have you ever heard of Joe Scheidler? Yes. The godfather of the pro life movement. Okay. He, he died in his mid 90s, like right. He was the last flight that I made into the States before COVID hit down for his funeral. He died just before Roe v. Wade was overturned and he mm. fought for it his whole life, like from Roe until then. And there was pro life leaders who flew in from all over the U.S. Um, I said that like this is the closest thing the pro life movement had to a state funeral. You had the head of Operation Rescue there, Scott Klusendorf of Life Training Institute, all him. these leaders there. Yeah. And he was in the Navy, too. So when they, they carried his casket out, it was covered in the American flag, and everybody sang Battle Hymn of the Republic um, as they carried him out. And wow. I was like, people, we should know who he is, yeah. because we all know who Kinsey is and Hugh Kefner right. is and Larry Flint is. And then our subcultures need to have our own heroes, the people who actually carry the torch through this dark period where yeah. everything was being thrown out. And these are the Joe Scheidlers and the Phyllis Schlafly's going, and the yeah. ordinary Irish pro-lifers. Mm-hmm. No, and and they're not going to get a Hollywood blockbuster movie. But this is what I look at the Daily Wire. I'm like, this, this is, is what, your opportunity. This is what. And some of the stories are so phenomenal. Like, how has nobody told the story of Malcolm Muggeridge yet? Mm-hmm. Right. The journalist who exposed the whole Demore w- was almost everywhere at any point, then discovered Mother Teresa and became one of the great Christian apologists. Like, there's so many stories out there that Hollywood will never tell that conservatives have the opportunity to tell and mm-hmm. introduce to our kids. Like, it's not for lack of heroes that we have no stories. It's because we don't have storytellers who are telling them and that's something i think that we need to fix because the reason our social imaginary has been shaped the way that it has is because those storytellers are compelling they're good at what they do right i think too often christians have been like well that movies it's ugly it's gross and 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 you know it's not even funny i'm like no it's funny it's really beautifully put together the story is very powerful but it's wrong if you just tell kids it sucks they're gonna be like well i think it's great yeah right you have to admit that these are very talented people using their talents in the service of evil yeah, that's right. And so we need to celebrate our own heroes and realize that the counter-revolution has been going on as long as the sexual revolution has, and there's some really incredible stories almost nobody knows. Have you heard of Michael Corrin, Canadian journalist, <laughs> was a Catholic, and then, God bless him, has gone off the deep end? Any viewers from Canada who are watching right now just started hysterically laughing. I've been writing oh, columns yeah, I just, at him and back and forth uh, since his uh, third I just conversion. read his terrible book called The Rebel Christ. So I, I don't know if he's part of the Anglican Church or some he version now, yeah. of it. Uh, this is a fella who went from writing books defending the Catholic Church, because he was a Catholic, mm-hmm. Church's position against abortion, 
Uh, his book, I mean, he has a razor sharp wit. He's a very talented writer. The book would have been quite charming if it wasn't advocating for child murder and mm -hmm. sodomy and mm -hmm. and uh, anyway, it was it was just a, it was awful. But one of the points he gets hung up on, and I'd like you to respond to, is the idea that Christians are very uh, much against abortion, even mm -hmm. though Christ said nothing about abortion. Uh, but they're not interested in sort of like governmental changes that would seek to uh, raise the poor out of poverty. We don't care about the poor. Maybe individually we do. But, you know, you've heard these objections. What, what do you say? So it's really interesting because I've often said that um, right now Michael Korn's writing is like a cage fight between Michael Korn and Michael Korn with the main <laughs> casualty being his credibility. Oh. He wrote a book himself uh, called Heresy in which he debunks the feeblest <laughs> arguments against Christianity. And he has and a chapter. And he makes them. No, and he has a chapter on this exact point about that those critiquing Christians about abortion are, are, are fundamentally disingenuous. They're ignoring all the facts. Like anybody who read the books he wrote previously as a Catholic and then read the books he wrote now, it, it honestly, lo it's like he's doing a Stephen Colbert impress impre <laughs> impression of, of his former self. Yeah. Like he, he just writes the same column over and over and over again. At this point, I could write the same column yeah. that he writes, Chat but BT better could. and more interesting than he does. Because yeah. he says the same thing. Oh, Chat GPT, Michael Making, Korn column. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that later. Um, <laughs> in response to, um, I have a twofold response to the idea that pro-lifers don't care about God government assistance, et cetera, et cetera. The first response I'll make, especially with regard to the United States, is that there has been over 3,000 crisis pregnancy centers set up with the explicit purpose of actually reaching out to the needy, to supplying them everything they need, to persuade them not to have abortions, and then to walk with them after they've chosen life. Now, many of them do not believe the government should help and are willing instead to put their money where their mouth is. So these are not cold-blooded conservatives who are like, this is the free market, and so as such, you know, you're going to have to struggle and suffer alone. What they're saying is the government shouldn't do it. We will. We will donate generously hundreds of millions of dollars a year to set up this structure of crisis pregnancy centers to help women in need. So the whole, the whole premise is just either a lack of research or, in, in his case, willful and ignorant propaganda. On the other end, though, I would uh, I was actually I participated in a in a project with Eric Scheidler, uh, Joe Scheidler's son, who runs Pro Life Action League now, Dr. Charlie Camosi, uh, and several others to write what we call pro, uh, a set of post row principles, where we're actually advocating for the in a post row era the government to take steps towards doing what we talked about before, um, having a family oriented um, economy and ensuring that all of the governmental pressures are in one direction, and that is erring on the side of life and family. And so some of the things that we advocated for were, for example, making birth free. Because right now, it's cheaper to have an abortion than it is to give birth in most American hospitals. It'll cost you around 10 grand to give birth in most places. It'll cost you four or 500 bucks to get a first trimester abortion. All the incentives are running in the wrong direction. I think it should be completely free. Um, I, there's a lot of different policies we detail in this document on post row principles, which is posted online, um, where we think that the government could actually intervene to reduce the abortion rate, looking at countries like Hungary, Israel, which have actually done it. Um, this has been signed on to by hundreds of people now, Dr. Monica Miller, um, Erica Bakyochi, who just recently wrote a phenomenal book um, on on pro life feminism. Uh, another book. Uh so Mary Aberstadt also is on board um, with 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 this plan mm -hmm. of, of using the government to skew the incentives, pardon me, mm -hmm. towards life. Um, and Kristen Hawkins of Students for Life of America, Lila Rose of Live Action. Like there was representatives from every mm. different wing of the pro-life movement, the intellectual wing, the activist wing, the educational wing, the pastoral wing, all of us saying, no, actually, we would love the government to skew the incentives in the favor of life. So. All of this is to say that Michael Korn invents new ways to be wrong every time he puts pen to paper. Yeah. Yeah. God bless him. It was an exhausting little book to read. Why did you actually read that book? Out of I read it because I was going to do a debate with him on Justin Briley's show, Unbelievable. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Did he back up? No, I did. And, okay. and, then, the, and then the debate got canceled because, well, I shouldn't say, because I'm not sure Fair. if th yeah, yeah. things have become public. No, I'll be honest with you. I... I've, I've participated in one debate before. It wasn't a formal debate. It was on Unbelievable with mm. Justin Briley. And I was debating uh, somebody who said that they were a, uh, well, one of them was a sex worker and then one of them was a libertarian. And it was me against them on pornography. And I think I did quite well, but I'm not good at debates. Mm. I'm not good at thinking on my feet. Mm. And 
I was going to take this on. And so I, I got the book and was going through it and um, decided that I wouldn't do a great job at this. And so I asked if Trent Horn would take over, who's mm -hmm. a much better debater yep. than I would be ever, even if I took 10 years to study mm -hmm. the art. And so Trent agreed. And I, I so I wasn't going to just back out. Yeah. yeah. If Justin would allow Trent to do it, I would have I would have let Trent do it. Mm -hmm. If Justin had said no, only you, then all right. But um, then something happened that didn't have to do with Michael or mm -hmm. Trent. That, okay. That uh, yeah. Yeah. I just I haven't heard that name in, in quite a while because he's kind of a parody of himself in Canada. He really is because it's, he spends all of his time it's writing remarkable. columns that explicitly rebut his previous positions. Mm -hmm. So now he'll write columns defending radical sex education. And there's one humorous journalist for a newspaper who has a habit of just sort of like quote tweeting him with an article saying the exact opposite thing. Bless him. Much better yeah, argued somebody, you know, from like a very short <laughs> amount of time. He's blocked me on Twitter, so I can't see him anymore, which is annoying. But well, you know uh, how Thomas Aquinas writes, where he posts arguments against the position he will then make mm -hmm. to refute those objections. Mm -hmm. I mean, someone needs to just mine Michael Corrin's work and make arguments, you know, that he's currently citing and then refute him with himself. So I've done that before. And that's when he blocked me. Give me that. I did article. a Michael Corrin versus Michael Corrin. <laughs> Please, just all I want to read okay, it. I'll, I'll do a whole episode just yeah. based on that. And, and, and just if people think that we're being a little too hard on this fella. Uh, absolutely not. No, I mean, he's he's promoting abortion. He's promoting mm. transgenderism, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he's promoting these things knowing better. Yeah. Right. So the first time I ever met him, I was um, he was one of the speakers at a pro-life conference in Toronto. There was Three, four of us, I think, speaking. He was he was one of them, and he was basically debunking all of the arguments in favor of abortion. What happened? So nobody actually knows. People have like literally spent. Did his son come out as gay or something? That's like one of the theories is that maybe one of his his children did. Nobody's I mean, it's completely it's, sure. It has to be personal. We don't like to psychologize because it's a fallacy. <laughs> you know this sort of genetic fallacy, as it were. But there does have to be some but sort gosh, of explanation what happened? for how he abandoned um, all of these things. Um, Especially how like he he does this thing where he would send a provocative tweet bashing Catholics or bashing conservative Protestants or sort of bashing one of the issues that we care about. And then predictably, you know, some people on Twitter would be like, if you I hate you so much. And then he would retweet it and see like, look, I'm such a martyr. Look what I put up I with, with these loving people. I'm like that is the cheapest trick in the book. I know. Like, well, I don't know anybody what, who couldn't play that game. This is what game. Father James Martin does. Yeah. Are you familiar with this? Yeah. Film? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you know, us Catholics used to point at you Protestants and say, look at the mess you are. And, well, pride comes before a fall, <laughs> I suppose, because there's a lot of infighting that goes on among Catholicism. Yeah, good. I got one more question before yep. we wrap up, and that is, how do you justify violent imagery when uh, advocating against abortion? Yeah, so, so A, he, I would reject the framing. It's not violent imagery. It's imagery that shows violence that's being done to a human being. So to say it's violent imagery is very much to accept the premises that, like, speech can be violence. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is that abortion victim photography shows people what actually takes place during an abortion. And like every other social reform movement in the history of social reform movements, the victim must be made visible in order for the public conscience to be made aware of what's taking place behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. So William Wilberforce and the Society for Affecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade used horrifying imagery of what was being done to slaves in order to wake the average Conscience British person up. up to what was going on. Yep. Um, a photograph of the battered corpse of Emmett Till was used to trigger the civil rights movement in 1955 with both a public funeral that tens of thousands attended, as well as photographs published in Jet Magazine, which actually prompted Rosa Parks to her famous act of defiance. Uh, the same thing would be true for, for child labor practices behind closed doors. Lewis Hine of the National Child Labor Committee would sneak into these places, take pictures of kids with mangled hands, and, and would publish these things. And so, uh, as Dr. Monica Miller puts it, only by actually showing the only baby photographs of these children that were ever taken can these children take their rightful place among us. Mm. I will always say when a Catholic specifically um, argues against these things, I always think of the fact that like the <laughs> Mexican... you guys have crucifixes? Yeah, the, the, there's that. <laughs> yes. And then there's like the, you know, like the Mexican priests who were executed in photographs of them or mm. what triggered massive uh, you know, resistance in the first place. Yeah. Um, injustice that remains invisible inevitably becomes tolerable. And the Say that again. Injustice that remains invisible inevitably becomes tolerable. Uh, Greg Cunningham of, of CBR first coined that phrase when he described the fact that the reason most of us can tolerate abortion is because we're never confronted with it. We can go about our day like, you know, thousands of people aren't being torn to shreds behind closed doors. 
Um, and these images allow us to see what is actually taking place. They introduce us into another truth and a parallel reality that's actually taking place. And they are therefore, I think, essential to show people. The pragmatic argument I would, I would make is that uh, the organization I work for, CCBR, actually runs polling before and after people see the images to test their effectiveness. And by double digits, it's more effective than anything else we could do. 67% of people who see an image of a baby who's been killed through abortion feel more negatively about abortion explicitly because of what they saw and one of the reasons for this is because we we refuse to allow abortion to remain a euphemism if we are going to have a collective cultural conversation about abortion we have to know what it is that we're talking about first and what we are actually talking about is, is a human victim that's been destroyed and so the the best way to to combat this is healthcare. this is you know a clump of cells is to show them what's actually taking place so i would defend its use even if it wasn't um, um effective but because it's effective, I also think that it's imperative that we use them because it's the best way to wake people up to the truth of what's taking place and the best way to save lives. Do you think it's becoming increasingly less effective? I, I, here's why I say yeah. that. You know, we, we used to get told that abortion wasn't killing a baby, mm -hmm. and then we have modern sonograms, and you can no longer say that. Mm -hmm. And maybe in the beginning, the sonograms proved some people wrong, and they decided, right. okay, I'm pro-life. I'm not sure if sonograms do mm -hmm. that anymore. Is the same thing happening with these photographs? So I have, I have three separate answers to that question. The first answer... <laughs> like Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. <laughs> Number one. <laughs> so the, the first answer to that question would be because we live in, in, in an age that's so dominated by imagery of all kinds, these images are less effective than they would have been 25 years ago. But I would argue that the, it's, their use are even more imperative because we need a message that competes with all of the other visual messages. A visual culture mm. needs a visual, a visual message because that is how it understands things. It doesn't understand the really clever arguments that are often put out by pro-life apologists because that's not the way people think anymore because they don't. Um, secondarily, I, I think that one of the reasons that these images are becoming less effective to some people is because, the, yes, there is there is nihilists that you'll meet, especially on campus. When you debate abortion with people, often you figure out which conversations you just need to disengage from and move on very, very quickly because you realize this person's worldview doesn't actually encompass human rights at all. And it, often they're so hurting and so wounded that they just don't care. They'll say, I wish my mom had aborted me. They'll say things like that. And so it is true that as we discussed with the comedians before, that there's a growing number of people coming around to the idea that yes, it is killing and yes, I endorse this. Um, and that's why like people like Douglas Murray are concerned that the sanctity of human life will not survive mm -hmm. into the post-Christian age. The third reason is that the only religion our society has left is human rights, which is ill-defined or defined differently by different people. And so when we point out that human beings have human rights, human rights begin when the human being begins, science definitively tells us when a human life begins and therefore abortion is a human rights violation, that argument still works with a plurality of people. Okay. Um, I, I, I can see a, a, a time when that does get rejected. At this point, though, most of the people who work for our organization have had thousands of face-to-face -face conversations with pro-choice people on the streets. Because people still instinctively buy into the concept of human rights, that argument still is, is persuasive to many people. Okay, in regards to human rights, Matt Walsh put out a uh, documentary, obviously called "What Is a Woman." He yes. may have to soon put out a documentary <laughs> called "What Is a What Is a Human" or "What Is a What Is a Human Person," mm -hmm. because often uh, pro life advocates are told, "Okay, maybe it's a human life, but it's not a human person." You see, we're kind of redefining things. Mm -hmm. So, what do you say to that? So, there's the 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 complex personhood argument, which I'm sure you've heard before from other apologists. In terms of what works best on the streets, at least for me, yep. is what I point out is that they're using the language of exclusion. The, the, the concept of personhood as understood by human rights activists has only ever been used not to include people, but to exclude a group, right? So when women were human beings, but not persons, that was because you could then deny them certain rights. When African Americans were human beings, but only like three fourths of a person, that was for the intent of denying them human rights. And now the same thing is true for the preborn. So what I point out to people is that when they use the term personhood, they're using a term with a long, bloody and exclusionary history that's been generally used as a tool by people 
with the intent to victimize the group excluded from the umbrella of personhood. And people do not like being <laughs> accused of being exclusive. <laughs> yeah, no, that's excellent. Thank you very much. Where can people learn more about your stuff? And do you, do you have an actual website where yeah. people can see all your books and articles? Thebridgehead.ca is my website, and I have a sub stack. If you just go to The Bridgehead with Jonathan Van Maren, I have a sub stack newsletter where I send out all of my ruminations on the decline and fall of Western civilization. Mm -hmm. And so if you would like to be depressed bi weekly, you can find it there. <laughs> bi weekly or, or fortnightly, <laughs> yeah. depending on whose side you're on. <laughs> we put a link to that, uh, The Bridgehead. Thank you, Thursday. Um, excellent. And what do you got in the works? What's coming up? Right now, uh, I'm, I'm working on kind of two projects simultaneously. One is an updated version to the culture war where mm -hmm. I'm trying to pull together. <laughs> Which will be outdated three minutes after it's published, but good for oh, you. What I'm trying to do is sort of a deep dive into a lot of the phenomenon that are actually happening. Mm -hmm. uh, like, so even, okay, the institutions of indoctrination, um, like how porn is metastasized further in the culture and the effect that it's having. And I'm basically trying to take all of these like thinkers like Mary Aberstadt and Carl Truman and all these people and create a one-stop shop readable book for people who feel like they've gone insane yeah. to understand the historical chronology of how we got where we are. Wonderful. And so they can read it and feel like, no, I'm not nuts. Everybody else is nuts. And this is how we got from A to B. That's really helpful. Yeah. All right. God bless you, brother. You Thank bet. you so much Thanks for being for on the show. Me. Thank you, Thursday. And if you are watching right now, do us a favor. We've got three things to ask of you. Subscribe. That'd be great. Click that bell button. And then thirdly, please subscribe to Pints with Aquinas over on Rumble so that when YouTube inevitably bans us, that may not happen, but it's not unlikely, let me tell you that, we'll still be able to put out these excellent uh, interviews and have these wonderful guests for you. Thanks so much.